Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the Presidential Symposium at this 76th meeting of the American Epilepsy Society. It is wonderful to have you here in Nashville and to be here with all of you. I greatly look forward to us sharing knowledge and discovery to the ultimate betterment of care for people with epilepsy and to the renewal and development of lifelong friendships as the hallmark of this meeting and our society. Some, unfortunately, some sad news before we start. Um, this is uh, <clears throat> Jim Saragino. Uh, Jim Saragino unfortunately passed away um, just a few days ago. So as we start our program, I would like to ask you to take a moment with me to remember Jim Saragino or James Saragino, um, <clears throat> uh, who worked many years at uh, Oregon Health uh, Institute, Emeritus Professor uh, in the Department of Neurology, and a compassionate ab advocate for those with epilepsy who recently passed away on Thursday morning, December 1st, after a short illness. Dr. Saragino served as president of the American Epilepsy Society in 1984 after graduating from Oregon Health Sciences University in 1964. He began his career at the NIH NINDS Epilepsy Branch, where he eventually served as the chief. He joined the Oregon Health Sciences University Department of Neurology as a professor in 1965. Dr. Saragino was known nationally and internationally, serving as editor-in-chief of the journal Epilepsia and as president of the Epilepsy Foundation of Oregon. He will be remembered for his deep interest in people, he enjoyed events and consistently attended the AES meeting. And a personal note with Jim, always friendly, always uh, someone who was great to catch up with, and it's a, a very sad note for his passing. So to move on, um, you know, the AES meeting takes a lot of work. And this extraordinary meeting, of course, is not happening with a tremendous amount of commitment and work by many. I especially want to thank Barbara Yopst, Chair of the Council on Education, Dr. Ignacio Valencia, Chair of the Annual Meeting Committee, and Dr. Andrea Berniscani, Chair of the Scientific Program Committee. Please join me in recognizing their efforts. And listed here are the names of the outstanding group of member volunteers who have directed the major symposia and the investigators' workshops for this meeting. Thank you. Now I'd like to take the opportunity to ask all new AES members in the audience to rise so you can be welcomed. So please don't be shy, uh, stand up. We have 1,847 new members who joined the society this year to date, and our membership now stands at nearly 4,900 members. I thank you all for being part of this vibrant, growing professional community. And of course, our young members are really make our society go. So it's always exciting to see people that are interested and have joined, and we certainly welcome you here. Now, I'd also like to ask those of you who are attending the annual meeting for the first time, will you please stand? <laughs> Welcome, everyone. And my final request, if you're not a new member for the first time, and, or you're not a first-time attendee, and you happen to be seated next to one of those new colleagues, Please take a moment right now to introduce yourself. We're a welcoming community and it starts right here. So, um, you know, I'll add on that hopefully this, for all of you as new members and new attendees, this will be the first of a long journey for you. Uh, you know, the fantastic things about the AES or the relationships that you make over the years. And many times that, you know, I keep up with many of my great friends at the AES meeting. So hopefully this is a start for a journey for you. So now it's my honor to recognize a special group of members, our newest FAES class. This is the seventh class of the Fellows of the American Epilepsy Society, 
our peer-to-peer -peer recognition of professional accomplishments and dedication to epilepsy and to the AES. I want to personally applaud our new 2022 FAS class and ask all FAS members to attend in attendance to please rise. So thank you. That really, now that really is my last request. Not there's any more standing for so. Well, now uh, my next honor is to introduce Dr. Helen Cross. Um, the, the AES meeting is indeed a worldwide gathering. AES is proud to be a chapter under the North American <clears throat> um, chapter of the uh, International League Against Epilepsy. I'm honored to introduce Dr. Helen Cross, president of the ILE, who will present an update. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to produce a brief update on the International League Against Epilepsy activities. No disclosures. So the International League Against Epilepsy, of which I am the current president, is a global organization for those who care for those um, with epilepsy around the world. And it's a global organization of 129 national chapter members of which, of course, the American Epilepsy Society is one of the larger members. And although we're only in 129 countries, we actually, um, chapters, we actually cover 160 countries and territories. We see that we have many roles in furthering the care of those with epilepsy, developing the evidence base, looking at where there might be a problem and how we can make a difference. Education, of course, really key globally, worldwide. Advocacy, working in partnership with other organizations, and looking at tools with regard to improving care. Research, not necessarily into primary research, but advocating for research and looking at where tools might be useful and looking for validation. But what we've also developed over the past two years is the specific targets that we think are realistic in achieving. 90, 80, 70. 70% of those treated achieving adequate seizure control, 80% of people with epilepsy having access to appropriate, affordable medication, 90% of all people with epilepsy being aware of their new diagnosis as a treatable brain disorder. We launched a strategy at the end of 2020, which had been, um, we uh, developed through consultations with the community, and this has um, five pillars, standards and best practice, education and development, global advocacy, research and innovation, and organizational viability, of which there are some also cross-cutting themes, congresses, publications, and communications. And our structure um, actually looks to advocate for uh, uh, administrating that, that strategy. The councils aligned with the specific goals that we're trying to achieve. These are degree of continuity, not just stuck membership not just being specific to um, the terms of the ILE, which are four-year terms, specific task forces, task and finish, to try and look at new areas, um, particularly where we might want to make a mark. And then what I want to highlight here are our sections. The Young Epilepsy section that's now been established for at least four years, that our epileptologists and our epilepsy researchers of the future really being involved in what we do development of new ideas, advising us as we move forward, but also the nursing section, now a, a vast growing and thriving section, where they now have 567 members as of yesterday, a structure developing a strategy there in 59 countries in all six regions of the world, another area that really will help us move forward. We still have our topic commissions to look at specific topics moving forward, led by a variety of eminent individuals from around the world and covering a wide range of different areas. And we still, of course, part of that is producing position papers. And I just want to, we've developed a, a real system for developing position papers, not well established in the past, formulating evidence base, then formulating um, the idea and then putting out to the community for comment for then um, ultimately to have that incorporated. And I just wanted to highlight the position papers that were published earlier this year 
from the Nosology Task Force on the definition of epilepsy syndromes, of which there are five papers, but of in, within which there's a lot of information and the first time that syndromes have been formally defined in the history of the International League Against Epilepsy. Education is really a key aspect of what we do, and particularly to reach out globally to many different um, circumstances and environments. The ILEA Academy is really becoming established. Um, the curricula for level one, level two, and now also primary care are complete, and content for those different levels. Level one is complete, level two um, is, will be complete early next year, and primary care by the end of 2023. But of course, also in all regions of the world, there are many different regional education programs that reach out to the specifics of those particular regions, the needs of those specific regions. And over the last year, we've also developed an e-fora ser series, um, um, working on the, our experience with regard to virtual um, discussion this is a, a specific set of webinars whereby there's pre-reading, pre -reading, sorry, then um, the webinar for discussion, and then subsequent um, case on the academy for consolidation of learning. We have our publications, which are going from strength to strength. Epilepsy at Open had its first impact factor last year and went it straight with an impact factor of four, which is outstanding. Then we also have, of course, Epilepsy are growing from strength to strength and Epileptic Disorders, our educational journal. Epigraph is one of our periodical reviews where we report on what is going on around the world, and we have a regular newsletter. And Wikipedia, we are trying to establish fact on Wikipedia uh, um, with regard to epilepsy, correct what's going, going on, and we have a specific project looking at that. And we have an increasing digital presence. The podcasts, which have developed been initiated after, over the past 12 months, Spotify, tell us, are in the top 15% of those shared, which is really encouraging for raising awareness with regard to epilepsy. We have an increasing YouTube presence with all the webinars that have been developed since um, the onset of the pandemic and a, a wide social media presence. And this I also wanted to highlight, the Global Health in Epilepsy database, which was initiated from the North American board, but then now has become and more widely applicable to um, the global advocacy effort, a, a database of different projects around the world um, uh, that have been going on to make, raise awareness, to make sure that we know there's no duplication of efforts, that we could increase collaboration, and we're really hoping that will also contribute to what I'm next going to discuss, which is the great achievement this year um, uh, of the achieving the Intersectorial Global Action Plan on Epilepsy and Other Neurological Disorders. After much advocacy work of the ILEE with the IBE in collaboration with the WHO, the IBE, the International Bureau for Epilepsy, being a patient organization, and of course the World Health Organization, that this Intersectorial Global Action Plan was agreed and approved by all member states, the World Health Assembly, in May of this year. A 10-year action plan with 10 targets over those 10 years. It's a global agreement amongst member states of the WHO um, of how we should move forward. There is an associated epilepsy technical brief with advice and ideas of what, what can happen that will be launched next week. But the global agreement and the IGAP has um, five strategic objectives with 10 targets for countries to evaluate. And these look at closing the treatment gap, closing the occlusion gap, and closing the research gap. Now, this is a global action plan for epilepsy and other neurological disorders, but one objective, a target, objective, objective five, is specific for epilepsy, although the other four, of course, are equally relevant to epilepsy. What it needs to be seen as, as a start, it's an opportunity for us to unlock doors to ministries of health and work with health planners and policymakers. An opportunity and a way of changing laws, strengthening collaboration with the WHO and partnerships, advocacy for increased funding, and a tool for amplifying the voice for people with lived experiences and local health professionals. It gives us an opportunity to hold governments to account through monitoring of progress and reporting, which they will have to do to the WHO over time. <clears throat> 
So how do we look at we are at the start of the journey? What the IGAP was, was commitment by all countries to implementing this um, intersectoral global action plan. They uh, will have committed to having data on epilepsy services and incorporating um, epilepsy and other neurological disorders in national health plans and budgets. And therefore giving us an opportunity to really work towards those targets of 90, 80, 70. One final word, looking at all the activity of this as we, we move forward over the next 12 months, I look forward to welcoming you all to Dublin in September at the next International Epilepsy Congress, um, September the 2nd to the 6th, where we will celebrate science collaboration and, of course, global care for those with epilepsy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. Excellent job. Thank you for the ILE update and for all the outstanding work that ILE has done on behalf of epilepsy. At this time, I'd like to recognize our supporters. Um, I'd like to recognize the companies that support AES through medical educational grants, charitable gifts, sponsorships, exhibiting, and advertising. I invite representatives from those companies to stand as I read your company's name. At our very highest level of support, we'd like to thank our benefactor level supporter, UCB Incorporated. Any UCB representatives, please stand if you're in attendance. <laughs> to our leader level supporters, thank you to SK Life Science Incorporated, Jazz Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, and ASA Incorporated. And to our partner level supporters, Norellis Incorporated, Synovian Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, Takeda Incor Pharmaceuticals, and Marinus Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. Thank you. And I also want to say a thank you to Supernus, Upshur Smith, and Neuropace for participating at the supporter level this year. So as a reminder, uh, please take time to visit the exhibit hall, level three, halls B and C. Times are listed here. It's an, an important part of our meeting and a great place to learn the latest information from our industry colleagues. And now, I would like to start the presidential symposium. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that this symposium is supported in part by an educational grant from ASI Incorporated. So I would, uh, as before we jump into the actual uh, symposium itself, I would like to take time uh, to introduce the Fritz E. Dreyfus Lecture Award. Um, the Fritz E. Dreyfus Lecture Award honors the memory of Dr. Fritz E. Dreyfus, a leading clinical epilepsy specialist, clinical investigator, and former president of the American Epilepsy Society, as well as the International League Against Epilepsy. Dr. Dreyfus was born in Dresden, Germany, and escaped with his family in the 1930s, moving first to South Africa and then to New Zealand. He received his medical degree from the University of Otago, New Zealand, completed graduate studies at, National, at the National Hospital of Queen's Square, London, and joined the faculty of the University of Virginia in 1959. In the mid-1960s, he began his working on collaborative projects in epilepsy with NIH, his pioneering work in objective documentation of Alzheimer's seizures, advanced clinical investigation of the epilepsies as a whole. Dr. Dreyfus was the founder of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Program at the University of Virginia. He was a mentor to a generation of epilepsy researchers and an educator, an edu educator with worldwide influence. As a member and chair of the ILE Commission on Cl Classification and Terminology, he tackled a job that many thought impossible, and through all, he remained devoted to caring for patients, including clinics in underserved areas of Southwest Virginia, which continue to this day. His influence has touched nearly everyone practicing or studying in the field. In 
And now is my sincere pleasure to, enter, to announce Dr. Terry J. O'Brien, who will later in this session will present the 2022 Fritz E. Dreyfus Lecture. Dr. O'Brien is Chair of Medicine and Neurology and, and Head of the Central <clears throat> Clinical School, Monash University, and Program Director, Alfred Brain, and Deputy Director of Research, Alfred Health. He is a former Van Cleef Rote, Chair of Neuroscience, Monash University, and James Stewart, Chair of Medicine, the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and the University of Melbourne. Dr. O'Brien is a specialist in neurology and clinical pharmacology, with particular expertise in epilepsy and neurodegenerative diseases, preclinical and clinical trials, and in, in vivo imaging in animal models and humans. He leads a large transitional research undertaking, both basic and clinical, clinical studies focused on developing improved treatments for patient, people with epilepsy and related brain diseases, including traumatic brain injury, dementias, and brain tumors. He has been involved as principal investigator in more than 150 clinical trials of new treatments of epilepsy, dementias, headache, movement disorders, and new PET radio tracers. This included his role as a, as a principal investigator in the STAR-1 trial, the first double-blinded randomized controlled trial of a cannabinoid treatment for adults with drug-resistant drug epilepsy, and for the first trial of a novel transcutaneous delivery system for cannabinoids. He has published more than 650 peer-reviewed original papers, which have been cited more than 28,000 times. Terry O'Brien has trained students and fellows from countries worldwide, many of whom have gone on to obtain independent funding and to be significant research and clinical leaders in their own right. Dr. O'Brien has received 17 awards for his research for national and international scientific bodies, including the Dreyfus Penry Epilepsy Award, the American Academy of Neurology, and he has held major leadership roles in the Australian and International Epilepsy and Neurological Professional Societies. He is the immediate past president of the Epilepsy Society of Australia and currently chair of the American Epilepsy Society's Translational Research Committee. And it's now my pleasure to congratulate Dr. Terry O'Brien as a 2022 Dreyfus Lecturer. Dr. O'Brien will, uh, will give us some recorded remarks. Um, for accepting his award. Thank you, Ed, for that very kind introduction. I'm sorry that after three years of dodging that pesky virus, um, including 260 days of lockdown and multiple COVID waves in Melbourne, it has finally caught up with me. So forgive me for having to give my acceptance speech and lecture on video. I would like to thank the AES for the incredible honour and privilege of being chosen to receive this year's Fritz E. Dravis Award and deliver the lecture in his name. This is named to honour a giant and a pioneer leader, clinician, researcher, and mentor in our epilepsy field. And I'll have a few more words to say about his outstanding contribution in my lecture to follow. Even though I'm a foreigner who resides on the other side of the world, I've always felt very much part of the AS family ever since I first joined the society and attended my first meeting in Baltimore while I was a fellow at the Mayo Clinic in 2019, it's in 1995. I'd like to thank the outstanding mentors I've been fortunate enough to have over my career, in particular Greg Casino, Alzan So, and Frank Sharber, as well as my fellow participant in this presidential symposium, Mark Cook, who originally introduced me to the joys and challenges of a career in epilepsy when I was a trainee at St Vincent's all those years ago. I'd like to also thank our president, Ed Hogan, who I first met when he was doing his fellowship with Mark Cook in Australia back in 1994, and who we've been great friends, colleagues and collaborators, as well as AES spouses ever since. I'd also like to thank my many students, postdoc fellows and RAs, who I've had the privilege to work with and mentor over my research journey. As everyone knows, it is they who do all the hard work. And it makes me so proud to see many of them gone on to be clinical and research leaders in their own right. Finally, I'd like to thank my family, my wife, Louise, and four children, Will, Patrick, Lawrence, and Alice, without their unending support, nothing of what I have achieved in my career would have been possible nor worthwhile. Thank you again for this great honour and I look forward to delivering the lecture shortly.
I will uh, wish Terry was here to accept this, but I will display Terry's plaque that we'll deliver to him. Um, he may explain further, but Terry and I have roomed together AES for a lot of years now. So this year, that didn't quite work out. So you, you got a, an unfortunate time, time case of, of COVID. So we wish him the best. He's feeling well, but unfortunately can't join us today. So. Okay, well, I'd uh, like to go on and we'll begin our session, as we said, with the, uh, Terry's um, acceptance. And I believe we're ready for the slides for the symposium. I'll tell you why we're, why we're on that. I will do some housekeeping. Um, first of all, uh, thanks for joining us uh, for the Presidential Symposium. Um, our faculty will be presenting very cutting edge information and unpublished data, so we ask that you withhold from, um, from any photography uh, for, uh, for the presentation. Um, disclosures, uh, it's a policy at the AES that all faculty participating in educational activities close their program to their disclosures to the audience, which they'll do, and the disclosures can also be found on the AES website. Um, I'd like to remember to claim Credit certificates. Uh, there's online evaluations that are open until March 31st, 2023, and pharmacy credits must be claimed by January 13th, 2023. And again, please see the AS website and our very nice app uh, for more details on that. And then finally, a reminder of the poster walking tours. Um, these will happen shortly, at the beginning um, at noon today. Uh, they'll depart. Uh, and so please be sure to join with, the, with these um, poster tours. All right, well, well, we'll move on to the next step. And I want to give a, a brief introduction about the ideas we put together for this symposium. Uh, and, um, and, and I'll introduce some of the initial speakers. So first of all, just how this came together. Uh, this first talk is on Caesar semiology, John Hewlings Jackson, and Jacksonian epilepsy. These are my disclosures, which are not relevant to this talk, and my learning objective. So the overview is first of a, a history and a little mystery uh, for the John Hewlings Jackson bust, which I'll describe. And please see the picture of the bust as it's displayed here at the front of the podium. I'd like to talk about the importance of seizure semiology and epilepsy, and then a very brief word about Jacksonian epilepsy and concepts of focal and generalized epileptic seizures. And again, with these, it'll be a very brief overview. It's a lot to be known, uh, but this will be in the purpose of uh, the concept of the symposium. So first, just a brief word about John Hewlings Jackson. Who was he? Very briefly, he was born in 1835 in Yorkshire, England. He completed his training at the York Hospital Medical School and worked uh, in York uh, until 1859 when he moved to London. Uh, he was appointed to the National Hospital for the Paralyzed and Epileptic as assistant physician in 1862 and physician in 1867 and continued on uh, in London until 1906. So he had a long career of over 40 years. During that time, he became a very prominent figure in the foundation and concepts of modern neurology. Um, I bear with me with a little a bit of history I think is really interesting, so I hope you feel the same. Uh, I read this article by Michael Trimble uh, soon after it came out in 1997, uh, and it's, it serves as a bit of a historical overview for, for Jackson as well. So um, this is the bust of John Hewlings Jackson. At the time of his retirement, a marble bust was commissioned by his colleagues and presented to him in, as a retirement ceremony in 1907. Um, at the time of this presentation, a couple of quotes I think are appropriate to highlight his standing in the neurological community. Uh, Sir William Gowers uh, stated that, uh, let us look upon this bust and then turn to the living counterpart, our master. So his expertise was recognized by his contemporaries. Uh, finally, um, when asked about what it was like to sit for the bust. He said, it is hard work doing nothing. Sitting still is being under restraint, and that is an active inhibitory process. 
So those of that have trouble sitting still can't quite say that eloquently, but uh, he was able to do that. Fits into some of his neurological theories as well. So, so that was the original presentation. And uh, Healings Jackson has garnered other admirers over the years. Wilder Penfield was a great admirer, and he uh, commissioned a bronze replica of the original bust to be displayed at the Montreal Neurological Institute. Uh, this original marble bust, unfortunately, was subsequently stolen. But uh, Fred Anderman, when he heard about this, arranged for a copy of the bust in bronze to be delivered to London, where the bust was, was received in, on 18th of July in 1996. So there's a bit more of the story from Dr. Trimble's article. It's that after the original theft, actually, the original bust was cited by a neurologist who had seen a copy of the original. The original bust was sitting comfortably in the dining room of a, north, in a house in North London, purchased for a song at a local antique shop. And communications with the owner, which I gather were third-party communications, not direct, uh, didn't result in a response. So uh, one of my hopes was, after reading this you know, 25 years ago, that I'd give an update and we'd found the bust and it was a happy ending. But unfortunately, no. The, 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 uh, the bust remains at large, uh, and I was able to, to touch uh, base with Dr. Tremble recently about this. So he's, uh, unfortunately, he's still gone. So I uh, can't give you a final end to the story, but I can show you pictures of all the busts. So uh, here's the original bust uh, that was marble, and you can see a side view from there. I appreciate... Uh, the help from my friends Nada and Andrea, <clears throat> Andrea Bernasconi uh, to track down the first copy of the bust that sits in Montreal still, I understand outside a neurosurgical library, and that was professionally photographed. And you can see it's, it's actually a pretty nice bust. But, uh, so copy number one, and then copy number two, again, Dr. Trimble was kind enough to send off uh, where it stands now in Queen Square, again, in a library where, where the uh, the second copy of the bust is there. So, so my hope was to give some answers, but I just present another mystery of the, the initial bust being lost. But if you can't solve a mystery, you might as well start another mystery, which is what I'll do next, briefly. So I appreciate Dr. Trimble also uh, showing me this ophthalmoscope box. He sent this document, you know, these pictures about this. And apparently, um, he was able to obtain this from acquaintance of Hewlings Jackson. So he was really excited to get the, uh, the box uh, with the ophthalmoscope, hopefully inside. Uh, and, he was in, and it was given to him, but alas, when it was opened, the ophthalmoscope was gone. So another, I, I only present another mystery of the ophthalmoscope uh, being missing. So a plea out there, anyone who's in the London area, if you see a familiar looking marble statue or an old ophthalmoscope, I'm sure that Dr. Tremble would be glad to hear from you to retort to its uh, rightful owner. So thanks for bearing with me. A little, like, a little, you know, those that like history have to do this a little bit to get it, get it out there to start the symposium. So uh, I will kind of take the next step and talk about, you know, the ideas behind the symposium. Why are, why are we doing this? And I, first of all, it starts with the importance of semiology. As clinical practitioners, we rely very heavily on signs and symptoms to guide appropriate care. And we'll talk about this as we go through the this, this, this symposium. Uh, in epileptology, the clinical history of seizures is, I think, especially helpful in diagnosis and treatment, extremely important. And uh, you know, finally, the factors that we all go through every day, right? The modern practice environment really can help, unfortunately, de-emphasize the role of a really important clinical history uh, <clears throat> In, in understanding what's going on with patients. Extremely important in, in establishing a good relationship with patients and a trust. And we get worried about too many other things. We have too many forms and too many tests to do, right? And we don't get down to the basics. So hopefully that's one thing we'll emphasize as we, we go through the symposium. We'll make a point for that. So how does looking at what Hillian Jackson do help us to that end? And uh, first of all, uh, for Caesar semiology, he was really a genius. He, he did fantastic. He was, what he put together, I think, is really incredible. And he really defined the concepts of epilepsy that were primarily based just on his observations and histories from patients. You know, that's what he did. He used semiology 
to build his ideas about, about the nervous system. And this is before uh, we had EEG, before we had neuroimaging, and we didn't even have guidelines. You know, you just had to do good, good old-fashioned empirical reasoning to figure out what went on. So I think it's a really good way to look at how can, how can you maximize the idea of doing a good history and physical from someone who was you know, a great clinician, but also didn't have these tests, right? They aren't there. And, and the next step is then to say with a lot of our speakers to, say, to take these things to the next step. Now that we do have these tests, how do his ideas hold up? So that's the idea behind what we'll talk about today. Um, a little bit of semiology, this could obviously be a lecture in itself, but I'd like to just talk about the, um, you know, the, the concept of semiology, right? I think people have different ideas about this. Um, there are signs and symptoms, and then you have semiology, which is really the interpretation of signs and symptoms. I've seen semiology defined as uh, the study of signs and symbols, but uh, for us, uh, signs and symptoms is probably most appropriate. And I have a, a quick example here. We all know you can have ictal crying. Um, ictal crying uh, is an example. If we listed all the signs and symptoms, they would be listed out as a list of things as I have on this slide. I won't read them all, but these are all things that objectively describe crying. However, interpreting all those signs, interpreting those signs and symptoms into a concept would be say that that's crying, right? So the semiology uh, that constellation of signs and symptoms would be crying without subjective feelings of emotion, uh, whereas signs and symptoms themselves would be just listing these out. So it's interpreting the signs and symptoms that you see. And this was Hewlin Jackson's real genius, his ability to see signs and symptoms and understand the meaning of, of, of what they were. So a quick word about Jacksonian epilepsy. It's probably the best known uh, epilepsy uh, that, that Hewlin Jackson described. Uh, he revolutionized the theories of the patho pathophysiology of epilepsy, and um, his detailed descriptions of focal motor seizures uh, resulted in the eponym of Jacksonian epilepsy. Um, a little bit about the Jacksonian march, which that's included in the title of the symposium. What was that? Uh, Hewlin's Jackson observed that localized epileptic seizures often affected the face, hand or arm, and rarely the leg, but in patterns. And he also noticed that after the attack, that limb may be weak or sometimes even completely dysfunctional. So this was his understanding of the signs and symptoms. And that had been described before, uh, you know, the, the idea about convulsions and other things. But again, the genius of Hewlin's Jackson was he understood the meaning of those signs and symptoms. And what he put together with, with this was that he understood that the, the symptoms were local. They were local symptoms. They implied the necessity of a local lesion. So he put together that these patterns must represent an organization in the brain. And that there's a part of the brain where these movements originated. Um, and uh, you know, he imply, implies that local, there's a local change in the nervous system. So this concept, this concept that the movements came from one area was completely new. And he didn't describe the homunculus, but the, this really provided the, ground, the groundwork for subsequent people to, to essentially describe the homunculus as we know it today. So uh, that's why the prominence of, of Jacksonian epilepsy, especially historically. So, um, as an introduction to the first talk, which Terry O'Brien will give in recorded, uh, as a recorded talk, but I'd like to step back and compare uh, Jacksonian epilepsy and the concept of genuine epilepsy. Uh, genuine epilepsy was a term that was used in the 19th century, Hewlin Jackson's time, which was relatively nondescript. Uh, I, I'd like to present this to you all, though, as an idea that this is it's very similar to what we would call generalized epilepsy now. Uh, again, it wasn't completely defined, so hopefully I can be convincing. Uh, but genuine epilepsy was idiopathic, not associated with gross brain pathology. The definitive clinical characteristics include cognitive deficits, psychosis, neurosis, and strong inheritance. A little more objective uh, comparison were from the writings of Hewlin Jackson himself. Um, if you look on the left, it has what he called the genuine epilepsy of authorities. On the right, 
uh, unilateral beginning convulsions. I'd like to present those to you as generalized and focal epilepsy as describe them today. If you look at point one, uh, there's no warning or a transient one for uh, genuine epilepsy, uh, but a, a warning or deliberate, is deliberate and local and, and unilateral uh, beginning convulsions. Again, is focal epilepsy, so uh, an aura uh, with focal epilepsy, not really one with genuine epilepsy. Um, genuine epilepsy, consciousness loss very early. Focal seizures, consciousness loss very late with unilateral convulsions. Um, the next three points really talk about movements overall, and I'll summarize those, but essentially with genuine epilepsy, movements start in a general fashion and are bilateral uh, in uh, what he described as, as uh, unilateral convulsions. Uh, spasms are limited, focal, um, usually on one side of the body. And then finally, um, the last point, march of spasm was rapid, so rapid uh, progression for genuine epilepsy, and spasms were focal and deliberate uh, in unilateral convulsions. So again, hopefully make the case, genuine epilepsy, more like generalized epilepsy, unilateral beginning convulsions are more like focal epilepsy. So couple of quotes to think, uh, make it clear what uh, Dr. Jackson thought about genuine epilepsy. He says, we want a positive information as to how convulsion is a departure from health, not as to how far it approaches our idea of the almost metaphysical conception of genuine epilepsy. And I'll leave off the rest for time, but uh, his, he was not a big fan of genuine epilepsy, I don't believe. Uh, and one other quote, uh, which is also telling about this. It says, we shall ultimately be able not to speak of a certain symptom as constituting genuine epilepsy or some variety of it, but of these or those particular symptoms as pointing to a discharging lesion in this or that particular part of cortex. So I present to you genuine epilepsy from a Jacksonian perspective is what we think of as generalized epilepsy, unilaterally beginning convulsions as focal epilepsy. And I think, interestingly, I think some of us still have those conversations today. What really puts these two things apart? Uh, you know, we certainly have classification systems now that have clarified very much so what generalized epilepsy is and a focal epilepsy. But I think uh, that the, the closer you look, sometimes the more complicated it gets. So the first talk uh, will uh, be Terry O'Brien and is, is a recorded talk uh, talking about focal and generalized epilepsy. I'll, I'll just quickly say that uh, the first three lectures I'll give brief introductions for. They'll be really the idea of presenting an idea that Hewlett Jackson put forward. And then I really look back at, uh, you know, what, with the information we have today, you know, was he right or not? Uh, you know, where does he stand today? And then the final two lectures will be just an idea of where we are with semiology today and, and applying that to really uh, modern practical issues in epilepsy. So, thank you, and I will now introduce Dr. O'Brien, unfortunately, remotely uh, for his recorded talk. Thank you, Ed, and thank you to the Society for the great honor of being asked to give this year's Fritz E. Dreyfus Lecture. The topic of my lecture today is one that Professor Dreyfus would certainly have had an opinion on, focal versus general epilepsy, generalized epilepsy, or more provocatively, are all epilepsies focal? So here are my disclosures, and here are the learning objectives for today's lecture. Before I start, I'd like to just say a few words of background about uh, about Professor Dreyfus and uh, his con many contributions to our field as a leader, as a pioneer, as a researcher, a clinician, and uh, importantly, a mentor to generations of, of uh, epilepsy researchers and clinicians. I'm very proud to claim Professor Dreyfus as a fellow in Tipidium. He uh, migrated with his family when he was 11 years old in the uh, 30s to uh, to New Zealand, um, where he spent his uh, his schooling and his uh, um, and then he went to medical school, the University of Otago, and uh, did his neurology training there before following the uh, great antipathy and tradition of going to Queen Square in London um, for neurological uh, finishing school. <clears throat> 
Unlike most um, Antipodeans, though, who returned back down under after their time at Queen Square, he instead took a faculty position um, in 1958 in the, at the University of Virginia, where he spent the rest of his absolutely stellar career. During this time, he made enormous contributions in leadership um, to the and research to the epilepsy field. He was the president of the AES as well as the ILE and many other leadership roles in our field. He also uh, was one of the pioneers in instituting the concept of the comprehensive epilepsy program. And along with this, the importance and value of uh, incorporating video EEG into the clinical evaluation. It was This was of great relevance then to um, what, what possibly is his uh, greatest contribution to the field, which is leading the uh, early ILE classifications of seizures and epilepsy, which I'll talk about more later, which relied very much on the clinical electrical findings from video EEG monitoring. So the initial ILE classification system, which was led by uh, uh, Fritz Dreyfus as well as uh, other colleagues, um, dichotomized epilepsy into, into partial and into generalized seizures, or seizures into partial and generalized, um, and, uh, and epilepsies into uh, to partial and generalized epilepsies also. While going back to Hewlings Jackson time, there had been a con this concept of uh, generalized versus focal epilepsies that it really didn't become uh, entrenched in the epilepsy uh, um, uh, community until after these classification systems. Partial seizures were defined as those which, in general, the first clinical and electrographic changes indicate the initial activation of the system of neurons limited to one part of one cerebral hemisphere. And generalized seizures are those in which the first clinical electrographic changes indicate initial involvement of both hemispheres. We use this classification system for the next 30 or so years. And then after many um, fierce classification battles in 2017, um, incorporating a number of the advances in, in understanding of neurobiology of epilepsy, we've uh, now settled on our, uh, our current classification system with the classification of seizures um, led by Bob Fisher and the classification of epilepsies led by my colleague from Melbourne, Ingrid Sheffer. The new classification system um, takes into uh, account um, the, the, the emerging concept that epilepsies are a network disorder. And along with this, it, uh, it notes that, uh, that focal epilepsy, fo what it calls focal from onset, epilep uh, onset seizures, um, are defined as those that originate within networks limited to one hemisphere rather than necessarily a single focus in itself. Uh, and generalised from onset seizures were defined as originating at some point within and rapidly engaging bilaterally distributed networks. Classifying a seizure as having an apparent generalised onset, however, does not rule out a focal onset that has been obscured by limitations, current methods. Uh, and this is a really important point that the uh, the, the authors of these, um, these papers um, have, have emphasised. So this is more a a question of correct classification um, based on the uh, the, te the the tests and investigations we have available, rather than um, rather than a, uh, a conceptual classification difference. But in practice, it's not always so easy to distinguish between focal and generalised epilepsy, and there are many cases where the patients just do not seem to fit into the boxes very well. And this is an illustrative example from my colleague Andrew Neal from Melbourne, who had his video, e, had her home portable video EG monitoring read by Mark, fellow panelist Mark Cook. She's a 26 year old woman who uh, has been diagnosed with idiopathic generalized epilepsy, specifically JME. She's had three generalized tonic, four generalized tonic clonic seizures since age 15, all of which have been related to sleep deprivation with or without alcohol excess. Pretty typical story for a JME with warning myoclonus since teenage years after sleep deprivation. Um, she has a maternal aunt who has ep had epilepsy since childhood. Um, Interictual EEGs have consistently shown three to four hertz spike and wave and poly spike and wave um, it, it discharges in a generalized distribution. High quality epilepsy protocol MRIs have been normal, and she's been treated predominantly with lamotrigine at a dose of 400 milligrams in the morning, 300 milligrams at night, with reasonably good seizure control 
except for those breakthroughs mentioned, uh, convulsions mentioned above, largely which had, uh, had explanations for them. However, over the past two or three years, she's developed a new seizure type, um, which occurs two or three times a month. With this, she feels a, a, a stereotype sense of dry mouth, nausea, dizziness, a feeling of heat and uh, feeling hot lasts approximately a minute um, and she had, does have cognitive changes associated with this but not complete amnesia. This may resolve or may progress to um, limb shaking of one or more upper limbs and she feels that she's completely aware of that. The episodes last a couple of minutes and post event she has some cognitive and motor dysfunction before a few minutes before completely recovering. Her she um, Andrew organised for her prolonged seven-day home video EG monitoring using um, using the SEER technology, and the prolonged interictal EEG during uh, wakefulness and drowsiness demonstrated the typical um, uh, three to four hertz um, spike wave and polyspike wave discharges that you would expect to see in someone with an idiopathic generalised epilepsy. However, particularly during drowsiness and sleep, we also saw um, focal um, epileptiform interictal discharges um, over the left temporal region. And this was a, uh, one of her typical new type of seizures that were captured during the home video EG monitoring. And I present this with the, uh, the permission of the patient. Starts with some bursts of generalized spike wave discharges. And then the patient develops a rhythmic theta delta discharge maximal over a left temporal region. And clinically, she's obviously experiencing a hot feeling. Sits up. And starts to develop chronic head jerking. Forced head turning to the right, chronic jerking and elevation of the right arm in a figure of four pattern. Then evolving to more generalized chronic activity with some tonic positioning of her limbs. So then gradually decreases in frequency. So ceasing after about a minute and a half. So is that a focal seizure or a generalized seizure? Does the patient have a, a generalized epilepsy or a focal epilepsy? Well, in fact, there's increasing literature that patients with generalized epilepsies, um, in particular IGEs, very commonly have focal features clinically and on their EEG. Some really important work in this area has been done by my colleague, uh, Udaya Sefranaki, working with Mark Cook and Wendell Souza at St. Vincent's and Monash Medical Centre in Melbourne. They did a systematic review of 117 papers describing that had described focal features on history, semiology, EEG, on functional MRI in patients with IgE. Between 24 and 79 percent of patients in these series um, reported auras prior to their seizures, um, which is generally thought to be a focal feature. Um, video EEG monitoring of generalized convulsions so showed um, focal features on semiology in 35 to 46% with force head turning, eye version, figure to four size, focal chronic activity, asymmetry in tonic and clonic phases, hemiconvulsions, fencing posture, unilateral tonic dystonic posturing, postictal nose wiping, postictal hemiparesis, and asymmetrical seizure determination. 76% of patients had oral and manual automatisms, uh, particularly in longer seizures. Focal ep intellectual epileptiform discharges were seen on the EEG in 35 to 56% of patients. 
including those with JME, like our patient. Um, and this, these particularly were reported over the temporal region during drowsiness and sleep, as in our patient. Um, they then subsequently did a further study on 120 of their own patients who had uh, GGE or IgE um, with a mixture of different um, IgE syndromes who had were studied with 24-hour ambulatory EEG recordings. 64, 66% of these patients, um, who, of the 107 patients who had epileptic discharge in the EEG, had at least one atypical abnormality in the EEG, particularly during drowsiness and sleep, which included asymmetry in 28%, focal epileptic discharges in 21%, um, a third of which were exclusively unilateral, with frontal being the most common, followed by temporal, followed by occipital uncommonly. Um, there was also focal onset of epileptic paroxysms in 13% and focal offset of the paroxysms in 8%. So um, what's going on in, uh, in, in patients with, with these focal features in IgE? Um, it, as we, we rarely put electrodes into patients with uh, IgE uh, because they're, they're not considered eligible for uh, um, resective epilepsy surgery, a lot of the, uh, the basic neurophysiology work has been done in rat models, particularly the, 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 <laughs> the gears and the way uh, gears generalize absence rats from Strasbourg, excuse me, and also the wag rye rats um, model. Both of these are Wistar strains that um, that have been selectively inbred to manifest um, bursts of generalized spike wave discharges, which are associated, which occur about seven hertz, and are associated with uh, arrestive activity um, uh, in uh, in 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 the rats. They show a pharmacological uh, responsiveness um, to anti-seizure drugs that is similar to what we see in clinical practice for on seizures, with the fundamental uh, biggest difference being the fact that their, their spike wave discharges are faster than the three hertz discharges normally seen in humans. Some really groundbreaking work was done by the group of Guy van Ludichar in, uh, in Holland, where they put uh, grid electrodes in over the uh, cortical surface um, in vivo of of the wag rye rats and with some really nice um, uh, network analysis showed that the seizure discharge is actually commenced focally with a focus in the, uh, the lateral somatosensory cortex. My colleague Didier Pino um, from Strasbourg, who I did my sabbatical with, has also done extremely nice um, uh, single cell in vivo recordings um, in the in the gears rats, and has demonstrated that in fact the spike wave discharges usually commence with a small with a uh, with a brief theta discharge um, seven, about, of about seven hertz um, that occurs in the somatosensory cortex and then triggers the spike wave discharge. Uh, in fact, this this seven hertz thetarism is also seen in non-epileptic rats, uh, but in the non-epileptic controls rats, it doesn't trigger a absence discharge. There we go. And in some ways, we can we can think of this like um, at like the match, the somatosensory rhythm being a match, and when it hits, um, when it's flicked into dry wood, such as a, a an electric an epileptic climacortical circuit it ignites with generalized hypersynchronization and uh, and results in a uh, generalized absence seizure. On the other hand, when it's flicked into wet wood um, in a non-epileptic climacortical circuit, then it doesn't take off and doesn't induce a seizure. Some further evidence for this was found I work in our lab where we did uh, in vivo recordings um, in freely moving rats um, with multi-site uh, depth electrodes. And as you can see here, these, the spike waves discharges were seen to commence in the same general lateral um, somatocentric cortex reads in that the, uh, the group of, uh, of Van Littijar had shown in the wag rye rats and then spread um, intracortically initially um, to involve other areas of the, uh, the unit, the same cortex, and then subsequently ignited uh, um, generalized uh, spike wave discharges, uh, and that manifests in a clinical absence seizure. We also showed by applying 7 hertz stimulations on these electrodes uh, into epileptic rats 
that we could actually trigger with a with a with a seven hertz two second simulation mimicking this uh, this somatosensory uh, uh, rhythm that we could actually trigger typical um, absence type seizures, which looked identical on EEG and clinically to what we saw with spontaneous absence seizures in gears, and these were not triggered um, in non-epileptic uh, um, rats at the same stimulation rate, and the the area of the brain that was had the lowest threshold for triggering. Um, spike rate discharges was the uh, the lateral somatosensory cortex, where we had shown that um, we and others had shown that the uh, uh, the seizures originated from with the somatosensory rhythm. Um, we also showed that uh, when you injected um, into um, that uh, the somatosensory cortex anti seizure uh, drugs, in this case uh, MPY, which is an endangered endangered in, um, a uh, um, a natural. Uh, endogenous uh, um, anti-seizure neuropeptide that you get a very marked pro and progressive um, suppression of the uh, of the the seizures uh, with just a focal injection in that somatosensory cortex, um, and that you know, and that is not seen when you inject in the thalamus, um, and is as minimally seen in other cortical regions. So again, shows the importance of this this uh, somatosensory cortex reason in generating the seizures, and that can be abolished by uh, by injecting drugs. Uh, we also looked at carbamazepine and uh, and geese. The Lutichar's group has looked at lignocaine and other other anti seizure drugs and demonstrated very similar findings. Some very nice functional MRI work has been performed by the uh, the, the group of uh, my colleague uh, um, in this uh, pres uh, presidential symposium, Hal Bloomingfield, um, and again shows that the first uh, the first change at the beginning or just before the uh, the generalized spike wave discharges occurs in that somatosensory cortex before engaging other brain regions. So, what's the evidence that this focus also exists in humans? So this is a an example of a uh, a absence seizure in a patient with a, a young man with a juvenile absence epilepsy, and you can see at the beginning there is a a little theta discharge which leads into the generalized uh, three hertz spike wave, which is uh, is seen maximally over the uh, the uh, the frontocentral region, which would correspond with the somatosensory cortex. Some work done by the group at uh, uh, at um, Cincinnati um, in uh, in in eight patients, where they looked at, uh, at, fun at functional MRI in EEG and simultaneous EEG um, in patients who had spontaneous absence seizures, showed that the first site that activated uh, before the onset of the spike wave discharges was in fact in the parietal lobe and the posterior frontal region, corresponding with that somatosensory cortex. Similar findings has also been uh, been reported by my colleague Patrick Carney from the Flory and uh, and Austin, who showed again that the first changes that were seen was in on bold single was in that parietal cortex, um, anterior parietal cortex, uh, corresponding with the um, the the somatosensory focus that we uh, demonstrated in gears. So, um, you know, our, our IgE is just a variant of focal epilepsy. Well, in reality, that dichotomy between generalized and focal epilepsies actually is really important in clinical practice. Um, it, as we know, generalized uh, epilepsies are more likely genetic. Focal epilepsies are more likely to have an underlying focal pathology. Treatment options are different. Uh, generalized epilepsies respond more to uh, very well to Valparate as a drug of choice or ethosuximide for absence seizures. Um, and they have more limited uh, therapeutic options where, uh, and in fact, some types of uh, of, uh, of anti seizure drugs, particularly sodium channel blockers and uh, GABAergic drugs, and actually aggravate seizures in generalized epilepsies um, where they're effective in focal epilepsies. Um, and focal epilepsy is overall more likely to be drug resistant than IgE and may be candidates for resective epilepsy surgery. And the prognosis can differ too with uh, a number of the IgEs potentially going into remission and having a good long-term prognosis um, where for many of the focal epilepsies, that's not the case. So it does. Uh, this dichotomy does serve a major purpose in clinical practice. And the, the emerging data from large, large genome studies is really demonstrating that the actual underlying pathophysiology and genomic architecture is really quite different between genetic and focal epilepsies. Here is the, <clears throat> the latest ILE um, consortium on genetics led by Sam Berkovic and colleagues, which now involves 
um, over 16,000 cases of focal epilepsy, over 7,000 cases of genetic generalized epilepsy versus over 52,000 non-epileptic controls and shows 19 genome-wide significant hits in patients with genetic generalized epilepsy where no significant hits in the focal epilepsies and on subtype analysis, the genetic architecture is found to be quite different between the focal and, and genetic generalized epilepsies. More recent, <clears throat> it's also recent work from the Epi, uh, Epi 25 consortium, which looked at uh, whole exome sequencing data, found that ultra rare variants, um, uh, in, looked at ultra rare variants in biological informed gene sets um, that have been implicated in epileptogenesis in patients with D DEs, GEs, and uh, non acquired focal epilepsies compared to matched controls, and found that in the, the GEs, that there was a higher um, ultra rare variant burden in gene sets derived from inhibitory versus excited neurons or, or associated receptors, while the opposite was true in the uh, in the the, uh, the focal epilepsies. And the excess of ultra high, high variants in both the generalized and focal cases were implicated were in the same genes that had been implicated in GWAS as having common variants. So it suggests that rare convariants work in concept to cause these dichotomous epilepsy phenotypes. But they do differ, and it may be that the GGEs are caused more by inhibitory, abnormal inhibitory mechanisms, while the focal epilepsy is more by excitatory mechanisms. And this may explain why some of the uh, the, the GABAergic drugs, which increase inhibition of the brain, actually aggravate generalized seizures. So just finally, evidence that there is a dichotomy between um, generalized and focal epilepsy is some data that uh, uh, that Nia Chirac produced um, in, col in collaboration with Phyllis Onat. Um, when she was visiting in our lab, where she looked at uh, at the at the susceptibility of gears versus NEC rats to kindling, and found that the gears rats were resistant to the progression of kindling into the fully kindled state, suggesting that there was something about the underlying pathophysiological structure of the gen the, the generalized epilepsies that these rats had that actually inhibited uh, the development of focal epilepsy. So to finish, um, there's much evidence from human and animal studies that generalized seizures can arise from cortical foci and may have focal clinical EEG and FRI features. However, this is not inconsistent with the new ILE classifications for seizure types, which says generalized from focal onset seizures are defined as originating at some point within and rapidly engaging bilaterally distributed networks. So the fact that they do, do arise focally, at least on some occasions, is not inconsistent with them being generalized seizures. Where focal or onset seizures are, de are defined as originating within networks limited one hemisphere. And they show they demonstrate consistency as always coming from that same focus. Uh, and there is evidence from pathophysiological mechanisms that the mechanism between generalized and focal epilepsies are distinct. And clinically, patients with focal for onset seizures are user different differentiable from focal from uh, generalized onset seizures are usually differentiable from focal from onset seizures with expert epileptological assessment. And this is actually really important for selecting treatment options, prognostications, and genetic counseling. So thank you again for inviting me to deliver this lecture. And I apologize for not being able to deliver it in person. Um, I, I hope to meet, to catch up with many of you later in the meeting once I'm released from my isolation. Thank you, Terry, for a fantastic lecture. Well summarized. So I will give a, another brief introduction for the next two talks. And again, the first three talks will be talking about concepts within epilepsy, and then the last two will be uh, more kind of a modern day importance of seizure semiology. Um, but uh, first of all, I'd just like to make a few definitions of what Hewlings Jackson talked about with the dreamy state. Again, these are my disclosures. So they're not relevant to what I'll talk about today, and here are my learning objectives. So, um, Hewlings Jackson, unfortunately, kind of started off with the, you know, when in his writings, it's a bit confusing as to what he meant by the dreamy state. So, I've had many people ask me about this. What does the dreamy state mean? And part of the reason it's so confusing is that he used it in two ways. He used it as describing a syndrome, and I think. The dreamy state syndrome, as he described it, was a typically what we call the ictal and immediate post-ictal phenomenology in mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. So he used it really to describe a, an epilepsy syndrome. 
but he also used it to describe a symptom. So um, he used a dreamy state as a symptom, which he thought was a very specific symptom and believed there was a very central part of defining the syndrome. But he really meant, we oftentimes talked about the dreamy state in regards to the symptom itself. So um, I'd like to briefly kind of go through his ideas about that uh, as introduction to the next lectures. So first, uh, the syndrome of mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. I think most of the people in the room know this syndrome quite well, uh, but uh, most patients, about half patients have febrile convulsions. They typically have focal seizures that have decreased awareness of being shortly after the time of puberty and resistant to anti-seizure medication often. Uh, and the typical pathology is mesial temporal sclerosis. Um, to put together just, I'm going to talk about the, the symptoms, so the auras of mesial temporal epilepsy to compare this to Hewlings Jackson's uh, descriptions. Uh, the most frequent auras are visceral sensations, usually ascending epigastric sensations, and fear, by far the most likely uh, auras we see. Others include memory flashbacks, deja vu, dreamy states, complex illusions, and multifocal hallucinations. So compare this to Hewlings Jackson's description of the dreamy state, which I think is very similar. I think he did a nice job of describing what we would now call the, mesial, the, the syndrome of mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, he, in, aside from the symptom of the dreamy state, he also included a list of associated symptoms, which he called the crude sensations, and at least, and at least some degree, typically, of a degree of alteration in consciousness. So, uh, he, uh, as in modern concepts, the most common uh, auras he, he described with this were uh, paroxysms beginning with an epigastric sensation, fear, uh, rarely anger. Uh, the next few things we typically think with lateral temporal lobe epilepsy now, but uh, with paroxysms of uh, noises beginning in the ear and fits beginning with colored vision. Um, so a little different than the mesial temporal lobe, but we often see those, these symptoms together. And finally, um, the taste and crude sensation of smell is often described with this and with the modern descriptions of uh, multimodal, multimodal hallucinations. So I'd like to say that in his writings, Shulens Jackson essentially described the syndrome of mesial temporal lobe epilepsy uh, very eloquently and, and much in how uh, we understand it today. So I'd like to also define the symptom of the dreamy state. So again, this one symptom he thought was extremely important and shed light on really a lot of what he thought about the nervous system in general. Uh, so um, to describe how he, what he talked about with the dreamy state, uh, he called the so-called intellectual aura, as I call it a dreamy state, is a striking symptom. This is a very elaborate or voluminous mental state, one kind that is a re reminiscence a feeling many people have had when apparently in good health. So he had kind of a broader definition, kind of this all-knowing feeling, like you know a lot when you have this, this, this symptom. Um, I think this, this symptom is typically now referred to as a feeling of familiarity or deja vu, but Hewlett Jackson, I think, had a bigger, I think a little better definition of this, kind of this uh, heightened intellectual state or an over-consciousness, you like to say, like you, you know a lot more than maybe you really do. Uh, his descriptions, and I think the reasons he thought that the dreamy state was so important, uh, because it had a lot to do with how he thought about the nervous system. So um, he also called the symptom of the dreamy state a double consciousness, and describing it that uh, in the state of the dreamy state, patients are vaguely aware of ongoing events. So what actually goes on, they don't really remember very well, if they remember at all. Um, but they're preoccupied with this intrusion of the all-knowing feeling. Like they know a whole lot. All right, or familiar feeling, this second consciousness. And uh, stated this double mental state is it helps the diagnosis of slight seizures greatly. And I would completely agree with that. There's very few things where you get people who are just like, they feel they really know a whole lot, and they say, well, what do you know? And say, oh, I don't know, I can't remember. I'm accused of doing that sometimes. So I, I you know, that's maybe how I know it so well. It makes an impact on me. Um, so uh, one example, uh, this is a really hit, interesting historical example. Uh, Dr. Z, who I'll talk about a little bit more in the next slide, um, was a physician. Uh, and he uh, had very many interesting descriptions of his seizures. And he uh, describes the dreamy state uh, from his own perspective. 
He says, I was carelessly looking around me, watching people passing, etc., when my attention was suddenly absorbed in my own mental state, of which I know no more than it seemed to, be, to me to be a valid and unexpected recollection of what I do not know. So this idea of really feeling you know something, you ask people what was it, they don't know. So extremely helpful for a diagnosis. A little bit of history about Dr. Z. Uh, Dr. Z was a highly educated medical man who had the dreamy state. Uh, he wrote some really interesting uh, descriptions of his own seizures, and I've only shown one, but there's a lot more. I would encourage you to track those down if you're interested. Uh, and Hewlett Jackson reported on these in an article in 1988. It later came uh, uh, after the original writings that Dr. Z was actually Dr. Alfred Thomas Myers, a physician at the Belgrave Hospital in London and whom Helen Jackson was acquainted with and, and worked with. So he witnessed many of his seizures, so it had a big impact on his idea about temporal lobe epilepsy. So um, again, as I talked about before, Helen Jackson's real genius was not just describing the symptoms, but understanding what they meant, the semiology. What did he think was the semiology, the symptom of the dreamy state? And this is why I think he made it uh, a central part of, of, his, uh, of the syndrome itself. And what he really built on with this was the idea about excitatory and inhibitory processes in epileptic seizures. So he said the dreamy state is a self-duplex. It is both an abnormal mental state, one imperfect by deficit and imperfect by excess. So he understood there was a part of the brain being excited and a part of it being inhibited. And he describes it a little bit more here in relationship to the dreamy state. Uh, in the dreamy state, there is a double mental state, a negative and positive element together. The patient is seized with a slight fit, suddenly becoming, becomes vague as to his present surroundings. So, you know, the inhibitory part where he's not, you know, really able to take in new information. But the other time, he has a very positive sensation at the very same time, an in instant of having the dreamy feeling, with this feeling of familiarity. So the, from, from the clinical signs and symptoms, the idea that there's an inhibition and excitation within the nervous system at the same time. Uh, he, understand, he understood the clinical phenomenology of the dreamy state to represent these excitatory inhibitory processes as I talked about. And he wrote extensively about this. I, you know, I'm only scratching the surface of what he had to say. It's a very interesting way of talking about hierarchies in the nervous system and otherwise. Uh, but he used this as a central way to think about excitatory inhibitory processes uh, in the nervous system. And so we're very lucky uh, to have uh, Dr. Blumenfeld uh, talk to us about excitation and inhibition during temporal lobe epileptic seizures uh, to give us a contemporary view uh, of this subject. You know, a couple more slides to introduce Dr. Bernastoni's talk so you don't have to listen to me again between these next two, uh, next two presentations. Um, but uh, not only did Hewlings Jackson describe the dreamy state as a syndrome and symptom, uh, but he also localized the seizures. So um, I mentioned that he primarily used clinical semiology to make, his, uh, you know, to make his postulations. He did have neuropathology, but that was not in vivo, obviously. Uh, but he did follow cases and document uh, their localization by post-mortem examination, examination. So he did participate in Dr. Myers' autopsy uh, when Dr. Myers died in, 19, in 1894, where he described a very small patch of softening in the left uncinate gyrus. Um, he uh, eventually correlated the dreamy state with post-mortem examination in several cases, including the case of Dr. Myers, and what improved to be some of his very final publications uh, through pa clinical pathological uh, correlations, he linked the discharging lesion of the dreamy state to the mesial temporal region, what he called the uncinate group of fits. And to quote him, uh, he said, uh, this was on the hypo hypothesis that the discharge lesion of these cases are made of, of some cells, not of the uncinate group alone, but of some cells of different parts of the region of which the gyrus is a part. A vague, very vague circumspection, I admit, the uncinate region. So I'll, Dr. Bernasconi will expound on this and give us, some, I know, a fantastic lecture. Uh, but you get from this quote that I think he understood it wasn't just that area, that this was also from surrounding areas of which the, the uncinate region was a mesial temporal region, 
essentially was a functional part. So this idea about networks and he, again, he wrote a lot about uh, hierarchies of the nervous system. So um, we had the pleasure to have Dr. Neda Bernasconi will present the lecture, Neuroimaging of TLE, to discuss the current findings and concepts of localization of temporal lobe epilepsy. So with no further ado, I get to, uh, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hal Blumenfeld. And with all our lectures today, Hal and I have been friends for a long time. The AS meeting has been fantastic for us to catch up and it's been great to, to follow his work over the years. Um, Hal is the Longridge Williams Professor of Neurology, Neuroscience and Neurosurgery at Yale University. He's an expert on brain mechanisms of consciousness and alter consciousness and epilepsy. Uh, he uh, <clears throat> directs the Yale Clinical Neuroscience Imaging Center and is an active epilepsy neurologist and leads a multidisciplinary research <clears throat> effort uh, largely funded by the NIH. Uh, Hal has done some fantastic things. He's one of these guys who can do a little bit of everything. Uh, most people know that, that Hal's written a general neurology book in his spare time. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's uh, you know, as, as stated, a great clinical neurologist and uh, as he'll show today, uh, he's done some fantastic re research in this area. So Hal, it's my pleasure to welcome you up to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for this wonderful symposium, uh, Ed. I think that it's really great to put um, things into a historical context with Hewlings Jackson and um, really enjoyed Terry's talk about generalized and focal, uh, which are important concepts that have been around for a long time and putting them in historical concept, context and the modern discoveries are fascinating. Um, additional historical context comes from the idea of epilepsy as a network disorder uh, versus a focal disorder. Interestingly, uh, speaking of history, the last time I spoke at the presidential symposium was the year 2000 in Los Angeles, where Susan Spencer was the president at that time. And I had just finished my fellowship, and she gave me the opportunity. And I remember looking out at this room with many people. And it's the same feeling, I got to say, now. There's a lot of people here. So it's fun to be back. And I appreciate the opportunity, Ed. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next slide. I have nothing to disclose. Next slide, please. The goals, the learning objectives of what I'm going to speak about is to define the role of excitation and inhibition, causing impaired consciousness and temporal lobe seizures. And by understanding this fully, I think, expanding on the concepts that we heard about from, from uh, Dr. Hogan and coming from Hewlings Jackson of excitation and inhibition, we may be able to come up with new treatments leveraging this understanding of excitation and inhibition happening in the brain during focal uh, epileptic seizures. Next slide, please. As we heard, Hewlings Jackson, really based on semiology alone, was able to come up with these ideas that during the dreamy state, the state of impaired consciousness, which is so common in temporal lobe seizures, there seems to be this interplay of both excitation and inhibition occurring simultaneously. And a lot of what he described had to do with the experience of the patients, and this is something that um, I'm not going to focus on too much today. I hope that Jackie French in her discussion later on might come back to some of these concepts. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the impairment of consciousness that is so common. And again, Jackie French has worked on this. Um, Delgado Escueda, others uh, years ago, published important papers showing, demonstrating that a very important consequence of focal seizures in the temporal lobe is the impairment of consciousness. And in this dreamy state, um, as Julius Jackson pointed out, uh, I believe that both aspects, both the experience of the patient as well as this impairment of consciousness, are dependent on a mixture of both excitation and inhibition. Next. This is a uh, Epilepsy Foundation video from a few years back. We'll, we'll see Dick Matson. Um, describing a patient with a focal temporal lobe seizure. You can start the video, please. I noticed it was unresponsive uh, when people are speaking to him and that he has purposeless movements of one hand as well as some swallowing automatisms. And uh, this all goes on for about a minute and a, and a, minute and a half. Notice the mouth movements. <laughs> 
Clearly, he seems to be awake. Kevin? Kevin? But seems somewhat confused. Kevin? So he's unable to the respond. Other thing I'm finding in looking at this attack is that there's a clear asymmetry. So the patient, patient's unable to respond during the episode, and um, he's got, as Dr. Madsen's pointing out, some automatisms. So now, yeah, the episode has ended now, and he has some post aphasia and is, is beginning to uh, become more responsive. So what is that state that we just saw? Okay, it's not coma, right? The patient is awake, clearly awake, looking around, but is unable to respond normally, is confused, and has some problem with interaction with the environment and inability to form new experiences, or to remember afterward what's happening. And this is what we see uh, commonly in temporal lobe seizures. In addition to the experience that people have of these seizures, the interaction with the environment is affected, and their ability to form and remember new experiences is severely impaired. Again, not coma, but I would say this resembles he called it a dreamy state, another stage of sleep. Dreams occur most commonly, as we, know, as we all know, during REM sleep. But during slow wave sleep, we, set, we have parasomnias. Parasomnias, I would say, look a lot like this. So people could wake up, they could do sleepwalking, um, and uh, people have behaviors that are purposeful appearing, but are in a state that is similar to encephalopathy, where we have slow waves in the cortex, and we have dysfunction and impaired ability to respond normally. Again, similar to encephalopathy or delirium or perhaps parasomnias in slow wave sleep. So I, I'm going to postulate that that's the state that we're seeing. So a, yes, a sleep-like state, a dreamy kind of state, but dreams are less common in slow wave sleep. Uh, I think that this is the state that we're seeing in these patients. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is the hypothesis we came up with a number of years ago to try to describe what's happening in focal temporal lobe seizures with impaired consciousness. Normally, we're conscious because our cerebral cortex interacts with subcortical arousal structures, including the upper brainstem, medial diencephalon. If we have a focal seizure, next, in, next please. If we have a focal seizure involving one mesial uh, temporal lobe, this can produ produce phenomena um, like deja vu or other uh, uh, rising epigastric sensations, um, other sorts of fearful sensations confined to the limbic type of semiology, limbic phenomenology. And usually that doesn't, initially, if it's confined to a focal region of the limbic cortex, cause impaired consciousness or impaired awareness. So this could be a focal aware seizure. However, next. If this propagates to subcortical arousal areas, next, and disrupts their function, next, we then remove the normal arousal going to the cerebral cortex, allowing the cortex to lapse into a state, next please, resembling slow wave sleep, coma, or encephalopathy, where the cortex is not directly involved in the ictal activity, but because of this indirect network effect, we call it network inhibition, the subcortical arousal structures no longer provide a waking state to the cortex, and the cortex shows slow wave activity, and the functioning resembles encephalopathy or coma or slow wave sleep. Next slide. Some early evidence for this came from studies done using ictal spect uh, from our group. Actually, Ed Hogan contributed to this as well early on, where we looked at the, uh, the cerebral blood flow in seizures, um, in temporal lobe seizures, with impaired consciousness, without impaired consciousness, and found that with impaired consciousness, there was this particular pattern of involvement where the temporal lobe showed increased cerebral blood flow, but this, the frontal and parietal association cortices showed decreased cerebral blood flow. And this was associated with abnormal cerebral blood flow also in arousal structures in the midbrain and the thalamus, as shown here on the left panels. At the same time, if you look at intracranial EEG in patients during temporal lobe seizures, in panel C, you see the typical pattern of ictal polyspike discharges in the mesial temporal structures. But if you look in panel D at the frontal or parietal association cortices, on intracranial EG, you see a pattern that does not look like ictal activity. It looks like slow wave activity, the kind of activity we see during slow wave sleep. Next slide. This is just an expansion of this kind of work. These are some papers um, um, done by our lab. And uh, you can, and Dario Englot, 
and um, Fabrice Bartolome has also done very important, his work has also done, uh, his group has done very important work also looking at the uh, network patterns, the network connectivity changes in uh, the global workspace functioning during these seizures. And I would say that these kinds of ideas of decreased arousal and also impaired network function are, are complementary views of how the cerebral cortex and subcortical structures become dysfunctional during this type of epileptic seizures. So these are timed panels at different time points. And next, please. Next. You can see that at the onset of the seizure, there's low voltage fast activity occurring in the medial temporal lobe. Next. Next. And at the same time, next, if you look at the frontal parietal association cortex, you see slow wave activity. Next, please. And next. To really understand what's going on, uh, back, please. Back, please, to the uh, fMRI. One more back, please. Sorry, I apologize. This, today is the Jewish Sabbath, and that's why I have to rely on, thank you, I appreciate it very much, rely on someone else to help me uh, go through advancing and, and moving backwards on the slides. Um, this is uh, an approach that uh, we and others have taken to try to understand the fundamental neurobiology of what's happening in the brain. So the human work has shown us that there seems to be this big network effect where a focal seizure in the limbic system is disrupting cerebral cortical function, and that there's impaired uh, function at the same time of uh, deep structures in the brain. So using studies from a rat model, this is a, a grad student in our lab, Josh Modelo, developed uh, this, uh, this along with Dario Englaut working earlier when he was a grad student in our lab, uh, developed a rat model of focal uh, limbic seizures. Inducing a focal seizure in the hippocampus, you can see that there's increased activity shown by warm colors in the hippocampus. And you can see the cerebral cortex at the same time shows that blue color, so that's depressed function. Very similar to what we see in, uh, in people during temporal lobe seizures. So what's causing that depressed function in the cerebral cortex? If you look at the label which says CL and MT on these slides, those are subcortical arousal structures. The uh, midbrain tegmentum and the central lateral nucleus of the thalamus, something I'll come back to in a little bit, key arousal structures are inhibited along with the cerebral cortex. And if you look at the septum in the top row, that, the lateral septum, which is strongly connected to the hippocampus, and if you look at the anterior hypothalamus, those areas show increased activity. So the idea is that those areas, subcortical areas, like the lateral septum and anterior hypothalamus, are inhibitory. They're activated by the seizure, they contain GABAergic neurons, and inhibit CL and MT, the arousal structures, in turn leading to depressed function of the cerebral cortex. Next slide, please. Here's a summary of that idea. You can see the hippocampus is seizing on one side of the, of the slide, and on the other side of the slide, you can see that slow wave activity in the frontal cortex. So how do those become connected? The seizure in the hippocampus propagates to subcortical structures like the, like the hypothalamus, lateral septum. Those, in turn, inhibit through gabergic projections arousal structures in the thalamus, basal forebrain, pedunculopontine tegmental nucleus, other structures in the lower brainstem which might be critical for things like respiration and, and cardiac function could contribute to SUDEP as well. Inhibiting those deep structures in the brain removes the normal arousal function going to the frontal cortex and leads to this slow wave sleep-like state. We've done studies also in mouse models more recently. Lim Anasu um, and others from our lab have a, a poster session today which I'll invite you to go to. It's social, posters number 1.186 to 1.189. That's one point, little, little PR here. 1.186 to 1.189. Please go buy those posters, and you'll see uh, some of our latest work using a mouse, a wake head fixed mouse model, uh, doing these same kinds of investigations to look at the uh, neurophysiological mechanisms of depressed arousal. And she's found, for example, that you can measure acetylcholine in the cerebral cortex with uh, uh, fluorescently coded neurotransmitter sensors and there's depressed arousal in the cerebral cortex. We measured from the neurons, we've disconnected this network, we've stimulated the network optogenetically to really try to uh, flesh out the um, fundamental mechanisms going on here. And I'll show just a few examples of some of the studies that were done. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, Zhang Wei Yu, a grad student who did these heroic in vivo patch clamp recordings from cerebral cortical neurons during focal limbic seizures in the rat. And as you can see, in the uh, top rows, you can see that um, there's a hippocampal seizure in the HC row, 
to this hippocampal seizure. You can see that going on. And at the same time, though, if you look at the lower panels with the, the blow-up insets, you can see those oscillating waves. Those are slow waves. And you can see that both on the, uh, the membrane potential recordings in the red in the top row and also the local field potential recordings. The multi-unit activity has this kind of on-off on off state, up and down firing, which is characteristic. You can see during the seizure, look how much the seizure activity on the bottom resembles the deep anesthesia activity in cerebral cortical neuron. So the point of this is to show that cortical activity down to the neuronal level during focal seizures is due to a state of inhibition of normal arousal. It's not ictal activity as we typically think of it with increased activity. It's depressed arousal, it's inhibition causing a slow wave sleep-like state or a deep anesthesia-like state in the cerebral cortex. Next slide, please. And these are direct recordings from subcortical arousal neurons. And you can see there's the PPT, which is a peduncular pontine tegmental nucleus neuron during a focal limbic seizure. Initially, before the seizure at baseline is firing tonically. And we usually, again, think of seizures as causing increased activity. But look at the firing of that PPT neuron during the seizure. And in the postictal period, it's initially silent and then very slowly recovers. And this arousal area, this is a cholinergic area. If you go next. Next, please. You can see that staining this neuron uh, confirms that uh, with choline acetyltransferase that this is a cholinergic neuron. So knowing all of this, can we do something about this? Can we can we perhaps intervene and prevent this problem? Because patients with temporal lobe epilepsy can often be treated with medications, and some can be treated with, with resection to cure them of their temporal lobe seizures. But those who can't currently are undergoing, um, often will get uh, responsive neurostimulation to try to stop their seizures, which has been extremely beneficial. However, those people often have some residual seizures with impaired consciousness. And at this point, there's not much more you can do with current available treatments. We've done everything we can to try to reduce or stop the seizures. And their quality of life is still greatly impaired if they have focal seizures with impaired awareness that can't be stopped. So we go to the next slide. Um, this is, first of all, showing that you can uh, look at group analysis and find that the next, please. The activity of arousal neurons in the, in the peduncular pontine tegmental nucleus next and next, as well as uh, serotonergic neurons are all depressed. Uh, at the slide, at the uh, poster session I mentioned earlier, we also uh, showed nucleus basalis and locus ceruleus neurons in awake behaving mice are depressed during seizures. But if we go on to the next slide, please, this is something that we hope to try to do about it. If you start the video, please. Here's two rats. They're about to have a focal limbic seizures, resembling temporal lobe seizures. They're exploring their cages normally before the seizures begin. And now the seizure has been induced by a brief stimulus to the hippocampus in both rats. Both rats are now frozen. They're having seizures in the limbic system. Their frontal cortex is showing slow wave activity. The rat on the right is now receiving therapeutic stimulation of the subcortical arousal areas to try to restore function of the cerebral cortex. And in fact, the hippocampus is still seizing but the cortex is now in an awake state in this rat, and it's able to explore the cage normally, while its counterpart on the left, which is receiving sham stimulation, is still frozen in this dreamy state um, of resembling slow wave sleep, unable to respond or to move. Next slide, please. This brings us to, uh, to what we've now started, inspired by, these, by this work and by other work in patients, with this chronic disorders of consciousness where stimulation of the arousal system in the thalamus in chronic disorders of consciousness can improve functioning. We've put together a clinical trial to try to do this during a temporal lobe seizures. This is an early feasibility study uh, founded, founded by the NIH. It's a collaboration between uh, Yale and Mayo Clinic, Greg Worrell and collaborators there, Barbara Yopes at Dartmouth and others, and Nico Schiff, who's at Cornell, who has been leading these studies of chronic disorders of consciousness with stimulation of the thalamus has been an important collaborator for applying that same approach to temporal lobe epilepsy. And we're working, of course, with, the tech, with um, industry as well with a company that's providing the, uh, the devices. Next slide, please. This is the work of Nico Schiff and collaborators. Um, next, 
which uh, showed that with bilateral stimulation of the central lateral nucleus, the nucleus I mentioned earlier, that shows depressed function during limbic seizures in, on fMRI in the rat and also electrophysiology. Next, and next, and next. Uh, with this stimulation, uh, he found, and his group found that, and is continuing to work on this, you can find increased, increased arousal during uh, chronic disorders of consciousness by stimulating and targeting the stimulation to the bilateral central lateral nucleus of the thalamus. And there's a number of different convergent streams of previous work that has led us to this clinical trial. If we go to the next slide, please. This is the work of Brian Rutt and colleagues, and, um, and uh, Chris Butson also uh, has uh, been um, instrumental, really, in developing methods for targeting and doing electrical field modeling of the um, expected effects of stimulating and targeting this very small nucleus in the thalamus. So with these uh, white matter null imaging sequences, you can actually visualize the central lateral nucleus and target it, and our neurosurgeons are able to uh, place electrodes in this region, and with help from Chris Budson and his uh, team, we've been able to model the expected arousal effects on the cortex. Next slide, please. So Marty Morell and, and, uh, and many others, and this is Barbara Yobes' work, uh, have shown the efficacy of uh, responsive neurostimulation and the ability to place multiple leads into the human brain for treatment of epilepsy. Um, and this is the first goal, of course, is to try to stop the seizures. Next slide, please. The issue is, is that if you're trying to stop hippocampal seizures and also trying to deliver therapy to the medial temporal lobes, uh, exist, current existing devices that are uh, generally available for treatment do not have more than two leads. And we needed four leads to do this. We need one for each hippocampus and one for each medial temporal lobe. So um, Greg Worrell, Vasa Kremen, and the team at Mayo have been working with this investigational device, the RC plus S, which has four leads. And these are some canine studies they did with this device, uh, which was really important for showing the feasibility of this approach. Next, please. Next, please. So here's the approach. Next. First, we target the, uh, if it's a bilateral temporal case, bilateral mesial temporal lobes, and try to stop the seizures with responsive uh, neurostimulation, detecting and stimulating the hippocampi, similar to other conventional existing uh, treatments with responsive neurostimulation of temporal lobe seizures. If the seizures are stopped, that's great. If they're not stopped, however, next. We have two more leads, one in each medial, one in each uh, intralaminar thalamus that then will activate, we hope, the arousal system to restore and improve consciousness during and after seizures. Next, and next. If we have unilateral temporal lobe epilepsy, we place two leads in the medial temporal lobe that's affected and detect and, and stimulate. If the seizures are not stopped, next. Again, we have leads in the bilateral thalamus to try to restore consciousness. Next, please. Next. Here's the treatment algorithm. A seizure that uh, is initiated, next, will uh, trigger a det uh, first detector, next, which stimulates the hippocampus. And if that successfully aborts the seizure, we're done. Next slide. Uh, next uh, display, thank you. And um, however, if the seizure continues for longer than a set threshold, a second detector is then activated, next, which then triggers stimulation of the thalamus, next, and also triggers behavioral testing that's happening through wearable technology, a smartwatch, which administers questions and commands during the seizure. So we can look at our primary outcome measure, which is whether or not people are improved in their level of consciousness uh, and responsiveness during the seizure. Next. Next. Uh, next. There's been a series of papers uh, from our group. There's uh, other behavioral testing batteries. Um, Sandra Benneke uh, from ILAE. Next. And next. Um, and also, again, uh, Fab uh, Fabrice Bartolome and also uh, Andrea Cavana. There's a number of um, batteries out there for investigating consciousness, for measuring consciousness, for testing for consciousness, and other behaviors during seizures. Uh, we conducted a series of these studies and adapted this for the time frame of um, the brief events that are occurring and using it using wearable technology. Next. And this is what uh, is currently being done, again, in collaboration with Greg Worrell and Václav Kremen and the whole team at Mayo, uh, this beautiful system where the implantable device interacts with a tablet PC that is called the EPAD, uh, the Epilepsy Programmable Assistant Device. That, in turn, interacts with a smartphone and watch, which then administer these uh, questions and commands 
um, both verbal and nonverbal during seizures that we can then record all the data streaming continuously to the cloud so that we can uh, analyze and interpret the data. Next. Here's the timeline of the study. We've, we've, we have five patients that have been enrolled and are currently implanted. I don't have the results of the trial yet. We're currently in the blinded, randomized double blinded phase, which you can see in the middle of the slide here with uh, two of our patients. The others are about to enter that phase. So a year from now, I should have the results of the study. We do sham and therapeutic stimulation so that each patient serves as their own control. It's randomized from seizure to seizure. Each patient always receives therapeutic hippocampal stimulation to try to stop the seizure. But then if the seizure is not successfully stopped, that for each seizure, they either get therapeutic or sham stipulation of the thalamus. And then we administer the behavioral testing to try to compare the therapeutic versus sham thalamic stimulation. And that will be our primary outcome measure once we have the results of that phase. Next, please. So to conclude, next. Focal seizures arising from mesial temporal structures excite limbic circuits. And there's many aspects of focal temporal seizures that arise phenomenologically and semiologically from the excitation. However, next, there's also inhibition going on. And this active inhibition, uh, we have data from human work and animal models, uh, contribute importantly to decreased subcortical arousal and impaired consciousness during focal temporal seizures. Next. We hope that using approaches like this with the deep brain stimulation, um, I should mention also Fabrice Bartolome has, has uh, done work not just targeting the area we've looked at, the central lateral nucleus, but the pulvinar as well. And there's other potential targets that we hope could restore normal functioning and restore arousal so that these patients who currently don't have any good therapeutic options with continued focal impaired awareness seizures could have some improvement in their quality of life. Next, please. I want to thank the group. This is uh, the first implant that took place at Dartmouth uh, back in February. Next. And this is the uh, uh, second implant that took place at the Mayo Clinic. Next. This is our group at Yale that implanted uh, our first patient there. And we've had, as I mentioned, two other patients, a total of five so far. Next, please. I want to thank everyone at Yale from our, our big group of collaborators who are participating in the uh, clinical trial. And next. And our group at uh, Mayo, as I mentioned, led by uh, Greg. Uh, Worrell and the other collaborators there. And next slide. And at Dartmouth, Barbara Yopes and the team at, uh, at Dartmouth have been fantastic. Next slide, please. We also have, an, as I mentioned, collaborators at other sites who provide very important expertise, um, especially Nico Schiff and Chris Butson and jo uh, Joe Giacino, who really helped us develop, develop the neuropsychology uh, measures for the study, and all the others listed here. Next. And finally, of course, we want to thank uh, NIH for uh, making all of this possible. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Fantastic, Al, man. Thank you, Hal. Fantastic job. We'll move on now to uh, neuroimaging of temporal lobe epilepsy from Nada Bernasconi. Uh, Nada is a Swiss-trained scientist and professor of Department of Neurology at the Montreal Neurological Institute, McGill University. She's director of the Neuroimaging and Epilepsy Laboratory at McConnell Brain Imaging Center. Her research is dedicated to drug-resistant epilepsies. One aspect of her work focuses on the development of computerized MRI methods that, combined with advanced statistical <clears throat> analysis and machine learning, allow for detection of subtle epileptogenic lesions that escape conventional radiology. She also has done work <clears throat> and research and accesses the study of brain connectomics. Uh, Nada will um, give a fantastic talk. Uh, I think that you know, this idea, and, and with the work that she's done, she'll really be able to expand upon the idea of localization and temporal of epilepsy. So Nada, please come up. Well, many thanks, dear Ed, for the kind introduction. It's really my great honor and pleasure to be here today. I have no disclosures, 
So the learning objective of my presentation is for you to understand how Hewling Jackson's observations have helped directing MRI as a research and clinical tool to conceptualize and manage temporal lobe epilepsy. I have listed here Hewling Jackson's ideas and observations that I believe are the most relevant to neuroimaging of temporal lobe epilepsy. Firstly, he considered epilepsy as a lesion-related focal gray matter disorder. Secondly, he linked the dreamy state and associated symptoms to various mesiotemporal lobe structures that he called the uncinate group fits. And thirdly, he conceptualized epilepsy as a model to understand brain organization and function. So Hewling Jackson was a pioneer of uh, clinical pathological correlations. He had followed with great interest early pathological reports, particularly those by Boucher and Casovier, who had observed a palpable firmness of the mesiotemporal structures. The first description of MTS by Sommers, who described neuronal loss in the prosubiculum and CA1, and reports by Bratz, who had noted additional involvement of the surrounding structures, in particular the parahippocampus. Hearing Jackson's challenged the traditional view that considered these changes to be coincidental rather than causal, and that epilepsy was a symptom of an idiopathic condition not associated with uh, gross brain pathology. Instead, he believed that symptoms observed clinically in the dreamy state are related to lesions in the anteromedial temporal lobe. Hearing Jackson's view was uh, refined by later pathological studies, particularly those by uh, Falconer and Margerison and Corselis, who uh, described and demonstrated that uh, structural damage in temporal lobe epilepsy extend beyond the mesiotemporal lobe to include the thalamus, the neocortex, and the white matter. So such distributed whole brain pattern of pathology was already strongly suggestive of a system level disorder. Now, if we come back to the hippocampus, which is the uh, disease epicenter of temporal lobe epilepsy, more recent studies have shown that patterns of neuronal loss and gliosis are not uh, evenly distributed. So they can be diffusely uh, distributed across all subfields or predominantly in CA1 and CA4. Now, there is also a large proportion of patients who do not present with uh, detectable neuronal loss, but with gliosis only. These pathological distinctions affect the visibility of HS on MRI. So in general, patients with diffuse neuronal loss and gliosis are MRI positive, and those with localized or mild neuronal loss or gliosis only are difficult to see on MRI and are often referred to as MRI negative. So MRI pattern learning allows to quantify the heterogeneity of mesiotemporal lobe pathology. Feeding surface-based morphometry of the hippocampus, the entorhinal cortex, and the amygdala to a, a k-mean clustering algorithm, we could partition a large group of patients with temporal lobe epilepsy and unilateral EEG focus. So the algorithm identified four classes. TLE class two, shown here, uh, presented with unilateral uh, atrophy of the hippocampus, the entorhinal cortex, and the amygdala. TLE class one was characterized by bilateral 
atrophy of these three structures, however ipsilateral to the seizure focus. So I have to say that these two groups presented on global volumetry with hippocampal atrophy. Now, half of our patients have had normal global hippocampal volumes. So these patients were divided into two classes as well. TLE class three that presented with bilateral subtle uh, atrophy across the three structures and class four that presented with uh, some paradoxical morphology, namely an increase in volume of the hippocampus and amygdala bilaterally. Now, classes differed with respect to their histological characteristics. The classical HS was more prevalent in patients with uh, hippocampal atrophy than isolated gliosis. So this group of patients presented uh, almost three times more neuronal loss and gliosis on the pathology than gliosis alone. On the other hand, gliosis or isolated gliosis was more prevalent in patients with normal volume than the classical HS. And these are these two groups that were uh, characterized by normal hippocampal volumetry. And this can explain the somewhat paradoxical morphology of these class four patients where gliosis may mask subtle degree of neuronal loss. Now, patterns of neocortical and white matter damage can also be assessed using various imaging modalities. These include T1-derived morphometry, the analysis of flare intensity, QT1 mapping, resting state fMRI, and diffusion-weighted MRI. These modalities allow to model the main features of uh, TLE pathology, and these are uh, bilateral frontotemporal gray matter atrophy, uh, limbic and paralimbic gliosis, uh, limbic demyelination, uh, large-scale disconnectivity, and uh, limbic white matter microstructural damage. So far, the majority of studies have used uh, group-based uh, um, analysis comparing patients to healthy controls. Now, while group analyses identify consistent patterns across individuals, they do not allow to capture individual variability. Assessing individual variability, on the other hand, is a step towards patient-centered care. So in this study, we use topic modeling and unsupervised machine learning which identifies latent relation or disease factors from MRI data and quantifies their co-expression within each patient. This approach allows each individual to express multiple disease factors to various degrees rather than assigning patients to a single subtype as it is done in clustering. So, in short, we obtain first uh, vertex-wise uh, features of uh, TLE pathology across the cortex, the uh, uh, subcortical white matter, and the hippocampus. These features are Z-scored with respect to healthy controls. So in this matrix, rows represent individual patients and columns features Z-scored ipsilateral and contralateral to the seizure focus. We then transform these Z-scores into counts in order to quantify the, um, the degree of or the load of pathology for each feature and each patient. So in this matrix, higher counts or brighter colors indicate more severe pathology. Finally, we applied the latent Dirichlet allocation, which is a topic modeling algorithm to this data. So the algorithm identified four disease factors. These factors 
which are also presented here and schematically represented here, were variably co-expressed within each patient. Now, more specifically, factor one was characterized by hypsilateral hippocampal damage. Factor two, by bilateral, sorry, by bilateral hippocampal and neocortical paralimbic gliosis, which we can see here. Factor three, by bilateral neocortical atrophy, and factor four, by bilateral white matter microstructural damage. Each of these four factors were variably expressed within each patient as shown by the position of the majority of the patients in the center of this dimensional factor space. So these four disease factors were not expressed in healthy controls and only minimally in patients with frontal lobe epilepsy, which supports specificity for temporal lobe epilepsy. Now, classifiers that were trained on disease factors could predict drug response in 76% of the uh, patients and post-surgical seizure outcome in 88% of patients, outperforming learners that were trained on group-level data, which is shown here. And specifically, factor one, which was ipsilateral hippocampal damage, was highly predictive of drug resistance, while factor one and four, so ipsilateral hippocampal damage and bilateral white matter damage, were highly predictive of angle one outcome. So by assessing the co-expression of latent structural pathology that would otherwise be missed, MRI biotyping provides a description of individual variability, ultimately refining the prediction of clinical outcomes. Now, as I said earlier, uh, Hewling Jackson promoted epilepsy as a model to understand brain organization and function. In this work, we assessed the organizational properties of mesiotemporal networks by using the structural covariance of subregional volumes of the hippocampus, entorhinal cortex, and the amygdala. In this network graph, we can see that in healthy controls, there is a dense pattern of connections between these three structures. Now, when we look at patients with left or right temporal lobe epilepsy, we can do two observations. Firstly, we can see that there is a breakdown of connectivity between these structures, particularly between the hippocampus and the amygdala. You see there are no lines anymore. And secondly, there is an increase in intrastructure connectivity, which was mostly present in the hippocampus and the amygdala again. Now, to quantify this uh, topology of the mesiotemporal networks, we use two graph theoretical metrics. Uh, the clustering coefficient, which is a measure of local efficiency, and the path length, which is a measure of global efficiency. So, now, if we look at healthy controls, there is a balance between local efficiency and global efficiency. And this is referred to as a small world network or small world architecture. Now, temporal lobe epilepsy patients uh, were uh, characterized by a regular topology, which is characterized by an increase in clustering, which means an increase in local efficiency, and this may be due axonal sprouting. They were also displaying increased path length, which is uh, signifying a decrease in global efficiency, and this may be due to a deafferentation of hippocampal connections. <clears throat> 
Now, hierarchy is a prevailing model of brain organization. It emphasizes the iterative dialogue between forward sensory fugal and backward sensory petal systems. In other words, the brain integrates information from the external world in multimodal and association areas by means of sensory streams. We can see that here. So, how can we track in vivo functional streams? Well, we can use stepwise functional connectivity. This is a graph theory method that relies on signal coupling of spontaneous resting state fMRI bolt fluctuations. So this method complements conventional approaches by detecting direct and indirect association in successive steps of connectivity. It calculates the degree or counts of all paths connecting a given voxel to a cortex of interest in an exact length of connectivity distance or step. So in these maps, we can see the connectivity represented at various steps in healthy controls and patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. The plots below show the strength of connectivity at every step which are color-coded with respect to canonical functional networks. So in healthy controls, connectivity transitioned from the hippocampus to DMN and heteromodal cortices before converging to unimodal sensory cortices. Now, when we look at patients with temporal lobe epilepsy, we see that there is a segregation of connectivity in limbic, in the limbic network, and with delays of connectivity to, be, to reach other, uh, all other networks. Now, when we look at the overall uh, strength of connectivity, we can see that there is an increased connectivity between the hippocampus and limbic and salience networks. On the other hand, there is a decreased connectivity between the hippocampus, the vision, DMN, and dorsal attention networks. Now, in order to analyze the structural integrity along the hippocampocortical functional hierarchy, we used T1 over flare, which is a myelin-sensitive contrast. So as we can see here, in both healthy controls and TLE patients, there was a progressive and expected increase in myelin content as we go from heteromodal to unimodal cortices. However, in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy, there was a significant uh, decrease in myelin content in limbic cortices. And this corresponds to the steps from 0 to 20. We also observed a negative correlation between the ipsilateral hippocampal volume and the strength of uh, connectivity of limbic and salience networks. In other words, the more atrophic the hippocampus, the stronger its connectivity to limbic and salience networks. Now, there was also hippoconnectivity, as I showed you before. The hippoconnectivity between the hippocampus and unimodal sensory cortices was associated with uh, cognitive impairments across multiple domains, as we can see here. So, to conclude, Hewling Jackson's ideas and observations have been fundamental. In one hand, to direct the MRI as a clinical tool, particularly in the detection and characterization of mesiotemporal sclerosis. And on the other hand, to conceptualize temporal lobe epilepsy as a network disorder. And with that, I would like to thank our past and present students who have conducted the studies I presented.
and uh, you for your attention. Thank you. everyone. Um, listen, Neda, thank you. Fantastic. Very extremely well done. I really enjoyed that. So uh, listen, we're kind of at a little transition in the program. If there's anybody who can't find uh, a seat in the back or standing, this would be a good time to come up. Plenty of seats in the front. And so please come on up if, uh, if you're waiting to make a transition. Um, I, I really like to thank our uh, uh, initial speakers doing a fantastic job. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to shift gears a little bit. Uh, before, this was hopefully a kind of a continuity of, of specific <clears throat> theories of epilepsy that Hewlings Jackson had, and our initial presenters talked about uh, how those apply today. We're going to take another step as in the next lectures to say, what does semiology mean today? What, is, what are the things that are really important for us to, um, to, to think about, and how do we apply just importance of, of everyday things. What does it work today for things? And we're going to start off with Jackie French to talk about the importance of clinical trials in, in semiology. Uh, Dr. French is a professor of neurology and comprehensive epilepsy center at New York University, Grossman School of Medicine, and founder, director of the Epilepsy Study Cons Consortium. She's the chief medical innovation officer for the Epilepsy Foundation. Uh, she trained in neurology at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, did her fellowship in EG and epilepsy at Mount Sinai Hospital and Yale University. I think we all know Jackie. She's done many, many things. She's a past president of the American Epilepsy Society, so she's set a really high bar for me to try to keep up, <laughs> keep up with. Uh, and Jackie, please come forward. Thank you, Ed, and, and all the previous speakers uh, for <laughs> setting up so well. Um, and. Thank you, Ed, so much for inviting me to give this talk. So these are my disclosures. It's the biggest disclosure slide for sure you're going to see all day today. Why? Because I do a lot of clinical trials. I work on behalf of a nonprofit called the Epilepsy Study Consortium. And the fact that this slide is so full and getting fuller means that there are many, many companies out there who at the moment are interested in doing uh, trials in epilepsy, and that is a wonderful thing. So what are my learning objectives today? To understand the contribution of a good seizure history to diagnosing epilepsy and diagnosing a seizure type. And this is very important in trials, and it's also very important in clinical practice, obviously. And I'm going to make a second point and we already heard a little bit about, uh, from Professor O'Brien, about the tonic-clonic seizure and how important it is. And I am going to try and talk a little bit about distinguishing the tonic-clonic seizure um, from a secondarily generalized seizure, which is an old-fashioned term you guys should not be using anymore. So let's start from the clinical trials. We need clinical trials to understand, first of all, whether a new anti-seizure medicine is going to be effective overall, but then we need to know who it's going to be effective in and which seizure types are going to respond, uh, which uh, patients we should use that new intervention in. So we have to understand, therefore, what type of epilepsy and what type of seizures people have that we are enrolling in our clinical trials. So, how do we understand that? Well, up until a few years ago, we were relying on investigators. Investigators sound like they should know what they're doing um, to identify who has epilepsy, what type of epilepsy they have, um, and what type of seizures they have. Was that a good idea? So this is where we get to semiology. Epilepsy is among, if you think about it, the few diseases where predominantly we make a diagnosis based on the description of the seizure and how we put it together and what we hear. And we associate that with diagnostic tests. But diagnostic tests, and I will get back to this, 
alone can't make the diagnosis. It has to be with semiology. So understanding semiology obviously is critical in classification and appropriate patient selection. Now, here we are trying to do a randomized controlled trial and decide who we're gonna put in our studies and we have to decide it from afar. So the person is not in front of us, uh, the people who are running the trial. The per person is in the hands of the investigator, and the investigator may be anywhere in the world. Um, so this has really put a spotlight on the variability in what I might call this type of seizure and what somebody in some other country in some other center might call this type of seizure. But obviously we have to come to some you know, central understanding. So that's why we do central adjudication for trials. So <clears throat> adjudication forces us to focus on the seizure description to identify the presence or absence of epilepsy overall, the classification of the seizure. And often, all we have, and this is true for all of you when you're in your office as well, talking to a patient, is the verbal description of the seizure, except that this is a little bit whisper down the lane because the patient tells the investigator, the investigator then tells us, and then we're trying to figure out does, has that investigator actually made the correct diagnosis? So <clears throat> this has absolutely highlighted the critical semiologic elements that would confirm, do th does this person or does this person not have epilepsy and what type of seizure do they have? So we ask the investigator, whoever they are, wherever they are, uh, in an adjudication form to write a description in as much detail, and we even tell them, think that some other neurologist somewhere is gonna be reading this description and trying to figure out whether you got it right. So please give us all the characteristics that made you arrive at the diagnosis so that we can also arrive at the diagnosis. So this is an example of a description that comes in. The patient has a funny smell followed by stiffening of the right side, loss of awareness, drooling and is confused afterwards. We say, is there alteration of awareness? Yes, and this person has identified that this is a seizure that is a focal impaired aware seizure. So I think everybody in this room would feel very comfortable with this description. Yes, this guy understands this is a seizure, this is a focal impaired aware seizure, they got it right. Okay. So now, here is a second description. I'm giving you real descriptions that have come into the study consortium. The seizure starts with a rushing, burning feeling in her thighs and abdomen, then nausea, then dry heaves, and all seizures are this type. No loss of awareness. First of all, they have called this a focal impaired aware seizure, so already we have a problem that this person doesn't understand what a focal impaired aware seizure is. But beyond that, um, how many people would accept this, di this description, saying there is no loss of awareness and there is rushing and burning in the thighs, that this person definitely has epilepsy? I mean, I you know, can't, can't do a show of hands, but I think that there might be some healthy skepticism about whether this is a seizure or this is not a seizure. Here's an interesting one. This is the description we got. Atonic seizure of the bilateral legs with no impaired consciousness. Focal, impair, focal aware seizure with motor observable component. Okay, so I mean, this one just does not make phenomenological sense. And we asked repeatedly, there must be something else. Tell us something else. Are you sure there's no alteration of awareness? Um, and this is in somebody who supposedly has focal epilepsy. So that's where we get to John Hewlings Jackson, right? He knew to look for signs and symptoms at seizure onset whose initial semiology indicates or is consistent with initial activation of only part of one cerebral hemisphere. 
So if you think about somebody who's collapsing with bilateral legs collapsing at the start of the seizure with nothing else, that does not compute with Johns Hewling Jackson. So we have to say, we have to have some healthy skepticism. And unfortunately, many of these patients come in with what we are told is a normal EEG and a normal MRI. But what if the EEG is not normal? Okay, so let's take this person with that description that I just read to you of you know, bilateral collapsing of the legs, right? So I mean, a lot of us would throw that person into the video EEG monitoring unit because we're not entirely sure what's happening. Many of the places where clinical trial patients come from, there is no video EEG monitoring unit, or it's used you know, only for surgical patients or you know, relatively scarcely. Um, so maybe they have an EEG, and maybe the EEG shows an abnormality. What I want you to know is that phenomenology is still Im critically important, even if the EEG is abnormal. And I love this paper. It's from a long time ago, 1984, but it's still very relevant today from Gooden and Aminoff. And what they did is they went to the EEG lab and they looked at all the abnormal EEGs and the histories that people gave them. So what you have here is the probability based on clinical history that the person had epilepsy from very low probability to very high. This is, sorry, based on phenomenology, based on semiology, right? And then the adjusted probability based on having an abnormal EEG. And what you can see is if based on the description, the prior probability is very low, they have a really bad description like the guy I just showed you, actually having an abnormal EEG doesn't jump it up to uh, an 80% likelihood that person has epilepsy. It only jumps it up to a 50% likelihood. Maybe you thought it was like 2% and now it's 50%, but it's still not 80%. That person needs more evaluation before you presume that that person has epilepsy. So be very, very careful of somebody with an abnormal EEG and a funny story. So I'm going to move on to tonic-clonic seizures specifically. So tonic-clonic seizures are a special concern for us and for clinical trials because we really want to know, you know, it was interesting because I was talking to Mike Sperling yesterday and he was saying the same thing about epilepsy surgery. Well, the epilepsy surgery might not take care of all the seizures, but if it gets rid of the tonic-clonic convulsions, it's doing something really important clinically for the person. And the same thing is true of a drug. If a drug can't get rid of all the seizures, but it predominantly removes the tonic-clonic seizures, then you have decreased the risk of cognitive decline. You have decreased the risk of sudden unexplained death. So therefore, how can we know whether a drug in a trial is actually eliminating tonic-clonic seizures if we don't know who is having tonic-clonic seizures? So we need the investigators to be able to tell us, yes, this is a tonic-clonic seizure this person is going to track, and this is a, not a tonic-clonic seizure that the person is going to track. And you would think that that would be pretty simple, but it turns out much more complicated. So we have new nomenclature. You heard about that from Terry O'Brien. We now call seizures generalized tonic-clonic seizures and focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures. But there was an old terminology that many people grew up with that said partial with secondary generalization or a secondarily generalized seizure or a secondary generalized seizure. So because of that, I believe that a lot of people in the world believe that secondary generalization from a focal seizure means that you have bilateral motor activity and there is not a requirement that it is a tonic-clonic seizure. But as far as we know, the actual tonic-clonic seizure, which is um, you know, a very different animal, 
is the one that increases the likelihood, for example, of sudden unexplained death. Of course, we can't even know that until we make sure everybody is telling us appropriately what a tonic-clonic seizure is. So the consequences of ambiguity, there's a high likelihood based on the seizure descriptions we've received that if you just tell somebody, tell us what's a tonic-clonic seizure, that many of them are actually elaborated focal seizures with bilateral motor, motor activity. And if that's true, we're not going to be able to determine what the impact of a new anti-seizure medicine is to suppress true tonic-clonic seizures. And as I said, you may not be able to do SUDEP research either. So this would be a description that somebody might give. Shaking, subject has shaking of both legs, falls down, the seizure lasts 30 minutes, and I'm just giving you a, a demonstration of what such a seizure might look like. Okay, so I will ask for a show of hands now. How many people thought that was a tonic-clonic seizure? Good. Nobody did. But that is exactly something that where there's bilateral shaking for 30 seconds, right? So, um, so we very specifically ask, oops, is there bilateral stiffening? followed by bilateral shaking? Does the shaking start fast and slow down? What type of noise does the person make? Is there an ictal cry? Is there always a loss of posture so that the person falls down? Does the person drool? Is there, you know, did they bite their tongue and therefore they have bloody saliva? After the seizure is over, what does the person look like? What does the breathing sound like? Is there striderous breathing? Are they unresponsive, and for how long? Because if a, if a family comes in, or a, you know, mostly the family, because obviously the person doesn't know what they're doing during that seizure, but if the family came in and described that seizure that I just showed you, they would say, oh, you know, my, my family member shakes on both sides, right? So you have to ask these specific questions to know whether that shaking on both sides is actually a tonic-clonic convulsion, which we saw beautiful examples of earlier, or whether it's a, just a focal seizure with what we used to call secondary generalization. So is it purely a trial issue? Um, no, obviously not. Circumstances, um, uh, under which seizures happen, presence of very specific characteristics, as I just uh, told you, can increase the diagnosis, diagnostic certainty of a seizure or the diagnostic certainty of the type of seizure. But if you just take a description on face value, you may not get that critical information that is really necessary for you to make that definitive uh, diagnosis. And again, looking at the seizure adjudication forms from now thousands of seizures from thousands of investigators all over the world, we come to realize that those questions are not always asked. So even physician observers and reporters may not describe if they're not prompted to. And for that reason, um, and what is the alternative here? we could you know, greatly enhance our ability to properly diagnose by asking the right questions that are aimed specifically at eliciting phenomenology that is diagnostic. And we have a form for that. It's called the Discover Form. We actually used it in um, some work with uh, uh, Hal Blumenfeld to look at consciousness. Um, and, it, and it asks questions, it, it is a structured interview form that can be used 
For example, if I'm not with the patient, the patient is halfway around the world and I want to know what happened during the seizure, obviously asking the physician to tell me is not working so well. Asking the, the, someone there to do a structured interview where they ask the critical questions um, works better, definitely works better. So this is a form for the patient themselves. So when the seizure is at its strongest, can you still hear when people are speaking to you, still understand what's going on and what people are saying? This goes back to that double consciousness, which is such a beautiful concept, right? They may say, I'm aware, I'm conscious, but on the other hand, I don't hear what people are saying to me or I don't understand it. That's really important. Um, and then some other things, do you bite your tongue, do you lose bowel control, other things. And then there's also a discover form for the observer. And one thing that we found when we were doing the, uh, this form with uh, Hal Blumenfeld is that the, the observer and the patient can give you different phenomenologic information. So for example, if you ask the patient if they drool, they'll probably say no. If you ask an observer if they drool, they are much more likely to say yes. So it's important to get this phenomenological information from both the, the person and their family member or the observer, whoever it is. So we would love it if we could confirm every seizure on the face of the planet by video EEG. That is not always possible just because the seizures are not frequent. It's not always possible because there are parts of the world where video EEG is not that available. So phenomenology is the, the cornerstone of diagnosis in 99% of people with epilepsy around the world. So we have to get it right. A poor semiologic description, as I said, even in the setting of an abnormal EEG, should prompt further investigation before you just decide that that person has epilepsy. So you can do that with video EEG or these days with a cell phone video so that you can observe it yourself. And tonic-clonic seizures specifically are a seizure type that often gets misdiagnosed and you really need to ask specific questions of people and observers to make sure that all the elements that you expect are present. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jackie, fantastic. Well, I get to introduce our final speaker, <clears throat> and uh, it's Mark Cook. Mark Cook is the clinical director of the Graham Clark Institute of Biomedical Engineering and Sir John Eccles Chair of Medicine, University of Melbourne, and director of neurology at St. Vincent's Hospital, Melbourne. His recent work is focused on experimental models of epilepsy and seizure prediction and implantable seizure detection devices and treatment systems. We appreciate Mark coming all the way across the, uh, the globe from, from Australia. Uh, not only that, but I have to say, you know, all of our speakers showed dedication and we very much appreciated for all they did. But Mark did go the extra measure. I'll let you know that his son's wedding was planned uh, for this weekend, I believe, and they moved it until next weekend. So yeah, that's the ultimate sacrifice. Mark, please come forward. Thanks, Ed, and I'll never live that down, I guess. So thank you for the invitation, and it's, it's, it's wonderful to be here, and thanks to, to Ed and the, and the faculty for inviting me along. So I'm sort of the tail gunner here, just, just closing off everything. So I'm, I'm tasked with telling you a little bit about some modern approaches to uh, um, semiology and, and our understanding of seizures through the technologies that are available, a couple of disclosures there. Um, and so there are objectives today are to understand the evolution of current concepts of seizure semiology and understand how imaging and invasive EEG particularly continue to clarify the correlation between the development and spread of seizures. So definition of semiology, well the pattern of symptoms and signs produced during seizures. And these descriptions existed even in ancient times. 
uh, some of them r remarkably accurate descriptions. Uh, I've always been impressed with uh, Raphael's transfiguration. The illustration of the child taken to Christ with the seizure shows you someone who'd actually seen seizures and recognise these very particular features with the asymmetric dystonic posturing, eye deviation and head turning. I think it's a remarkable uh, feature that, that's rarely, uh, rarely commented on. Jackson, of course, did a lot to correlate the semiology of seizures with the pathological abnormalities and brought us to our current understandings. Uh, Penfield extended this through his work with cortical stimulation, seminal work with Jasper in, in Montreal, uh, early last century and, and Gasto went on to link uh, the phenomenology to EEG changes and, and Ben Code and Taylor Ash of course were able to correlate this with, with stereo EEG at a later stage. So Jackson and, and his understanding of semiology is quite remarkable. I mean his views were very different from what was held at the time and a, a lot of this was because he'd spent five years in his early career analysing the clinical phenomenon of epilepsy and then going to autopsies and we heard how he went and saw his, his good friends uh, uh, post-mortem and understood the relationship of the unsonate softening to the, the seizures but it was this correlation of the pathology very closely with his own clinical observations that, that led him uh, to the remarkable publications and these culminated in the study of convulsions published in 1870 in, in a fairly obscure journal at the time where it might have remained undiscovered, but he was a very prolific author. He's, he did something very dramatic, which was to remove the medulla from the equation. Uh, up until then, seizures were thought to originate in the medulla and the medullary abnormality to produce uh, vasospasm in the cerebral vessels and the hypoxia to the hemispheres that resulted was felt to be the cause of the seizures. Um, but he took that out, and, and we'll, we'll come back to how he brought that back in later on, but he, he took that out, and, uh, and this was you know, a startling change from the, the concepts at the time. So his insights still inform just about everything we do in our clinical practice now, which is incredible. Uh, who would have thought that 111 years after his death we'd be standing here having a symposium like this? But his thoughts were very wide ranging, so he considered that epilepsy would not only consider convulsions, but these other disorders of, of sensory, motor and, and mental function. What's not often spoken about is that he actually considered a lot of other things into this category too, like migraines for instance, so under Jackson's definition, migraines were also felt to be uh, part of the epileptic disorders. But he did bring the insight that the cortical origin of seizures was, was what it was all about and that the clinical expressions were determined by the site of discharge origin and the extent of the spread. And he made that famous statement, the mode of onset is the most important matter in the anatomical investigation in any case of epilepsy, still, still so true. And he speculated that this discharging lesion would spread laterally to other centres at the same cerebral hierarchical level. He divided these, these three hierarchical levels of epilepsy and that they would then explode into these lower centres resulting into the clinical manifestations that we observe. He later, he later considered that when seizures started and, and spread and remained only in what he called the highest centres, that there was altered consciousness only. And these highest centres he considered to be the areas anterior and posterior to the sensory motor cortex. And again, I think we can see a lot of similarities there to what Hal Blumenfeld was speaking about earlier on. So it became a bit confusing in that, that later on, he, uh, his writings varied a little. So in the later stages of his writing, he came back to think that the, the medulla and deeper brain centres were in fact very important. And that uh, laryngospasm, asthma, and, and other disorders could result from epileptic discharges in lower brain centres. So he actually almost did full circle in his writings, bringing them back in, although he didn't discuss that so often. So he certainly considered that these lower levels of function uh, could be the source of seizures, and I think we're increasingly seeing that they are important in the propagation and development of seizures and, and responsible for many of the clinical manifestations that we see. So not all of these ideas of his held up and uh, he certainly retreated from some of his earlier insights. But the 
the greatest insights he had, which form the foundations of the writings we, we deal with most often, uh, really have provided a, an extraordinary legacy. So understanding the semiology and being able to relate this to the source of seizures is critical in localization and, and thus to management, as we've heard. And there's a structure to the development of the features of a seizure that provide us a way of understanding how the origin of the event relates to the clinical manifestations. Uh, but it's not always clear. And uh, I enjoyed Jackie's talk because, you know, anyone who goes to a clinical epilepsy meeting, I would say anywhere in the world, gets to hear the argument between everyone in the room about what they've actually seen and what it means. And you can understand how difficult it is for patients and, uh, and clinicians in their office hearing these things and trying to form a, a definite view about it. Uh, Gasto went on to relate the clinical expression of the seizures to EEG patterns and, and understood also the relationship of the cortical and subcortical structures to the evolution of the events. And thus the concept of, of a network arose. Uh, so the, this idea of, of epilepsy as a network disorder is an idea that's been around for some time and, and Banco and, and Taylor Ash developed this particularly. And Susan Spencer went on further to emphasize this looking at work from grids and, and depth electrode studies, uh, making the comment that the network as a whole is responsible for the, the clinical and EEG manifestations that we see with seizures. The stereo EEG of course has allowed a much higher resolution um, of the understanding of the electrical activity which accompanies seizures and the anatomical uh, origins, uh, but also allows us to see that the distant and connected structures could be involved very early on in the development of the event, which comes back to another one of Jackson's thoughts, which was that just because uh, a particular clinical manifestation accompanied a seizure, it didn't prove to you that that area of brain was the only place that that function existed. So the stereo EG let us understand a lot more about the uh, uh, temporal and, and spatial aspects of, of seizure spread. Nevertheless, the targeting of the stereo electrodes is determined by the semiology of events often, and so there's a slightly circular logic to it often. And we still have this problem with, with sampling and, and the fact that the stereo EEG electrodes can only be placed in a relatively limited area of brain, and so ultimately the information uh, we obtain is, is restricted. But it does let you understand the functions of, of remote and, and, and uh, uh, previously inaccessible areas of brain and, and understand their relationship to seizures. So what about the contribution of MRI? Well, I'd have, I'd have to say that, you know, when I started uh, working clinical epilepsy in, in the UK, uh, high resolution MRI was really only becoming widely available and I guess the most striking feature of MRI was that it destroyed a lot of people's concepts about the semiology that existed. And, uh, you know, it was very common to see uh, abnormalities on imaging, which were in areas where people had never expected them to be, and there'd be much argument about their relevance to seizures and so on. And the circle turned around and, and people started to think, well, maybe we didn't need to worry about uh, the semiology and we could just remove the abnormalities that we could see on scans and so on. But uh, I guess more recent times, things have, have turned around a bit more, especially because we seem to have uh, removed just about every sclerotic hippocampus in the universe now, so that these are very rare uh, features and I guess what formed the basis of a lot of these decisions. But we did get to see uh, things like this where uh, you could see uh, abnormalities which were very small, which allowed exquisite localization of particular semiological features, in this case, the toothbrushing seizures, for example, and there are innumerable uh, studies showing MRI abnormalities and their relationship to uh, particular clinical semiologies which were, were quite startling. Others have gone on to show that with functional connectivity you can demonstrate that there are changes related to the way the brain works and the, the connectivity relating to specific seizure types and you know how much of this is uh, a consequence of the seizures and, and how much of it relates to the primary pathology underlying the seizures is still a little uh, mysterious in most cases, but it's clear that through functional studies of, of brain activity that we've gained great insights into the relationship between the clinical features of events and the underlying activity. And similarly with tractography, here in this work by Poirier, it's all showing that abnormalities in tracts could also be correlated with the clinical manifestations of seizures. So MRI is bringing other understandings to uh, uh, the way we see the brain works and the relationships between cortical areas.
This very interesting work with, from Sasagawa and colleagues in Japan looked at an enormous number of patients examining tractography, the clinical features of seizures, and uh, tried to establish what the relationship was, particularly between hyperkinetic seizures, demonstrating that these could arise in a variety of cortical regions, such as the uh, inferior parietal lobe, the temporal occipital junction, and so on, all, all with very similar clinical manifestations. Again, getting back to Hewling's dictum about how much you could deduce about the natural function of an area. So what about invasive EEG studies? Well, you know, for a long time these were, at least outside Europe, these were, were grids alone and, and samplings obviously restricted to the uh, surface of the brain and, and the more superficial aspects of the gyri. So we could only capture relatively limited information, but, but nevertheless, as with the work of Spencer earlier, it, uh, it did lead to a, a much greater understanding of brain function and its relationship to the events. But stereo EEG has really changed all of that. And the French, of course, have, have, been, uh, have been doing this for a long time. And Eileen McGonigal sitting in the, the front there, who's really uh, probably the world's authority in this at the moment. But the stereo EEG and the ability to uh, place electrodes very densely in, in quite tight areas of brain and then make these very uh, startling observations about the relationship of the discharge, being able to see its onset and evolution, and then do these beautiful studies where uh, electrodes can be placed in an enormous range of locations, uh, very deep in the brain. The interictal activity can be understood in relation to the location, but more importantly, the ictal events can be captured and as well. Uh, related to the clinical phenomenology in a way that we never could before, so that as the patient describes the symptoms evolving, we can actually see this with these, uh, with these electrodes in situ, uh, recording spontaneous events in patients and, and, and really uh, see exactly where events relate to symptoms, or what events relate to systems. And then combining that with high resolution imaging and being able to uh, really see just features which we could never imagine were possible and you know something which Hewlings could never have imagined uh, seeing these sorts of links and, and understanding how the seizures spread throughout very small areas of brain and how that affects their clinical manifestations. And there's this nice work that uh, Arne McGonigal kindly passed on to me showing just how beautifully you can study this. Very dramatic events, both start the same with this tan twirling on the right. And here's some slightly different events. I think uh, the purpose of this publication was primarily to make some parallels and distinctions between stereotypies and um, seizures. But it's the most beautiful demonstration, I think, of how you can capture this information through your stereo studies. You can link it to other features, which we'll come back to in a minute, uh, there in plots B and C looking at uh, 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 the, the motor manifestation, so the rhythmic rocking is being captured there uh, through uh, accelerometry-based data so that you can see the similar patterns in, in two different seizures there from that, that patient and, and down the bottom just a, a decomposition of some of the EEG data. Uh, 
Similarly with the patient with hand tapping, you can see the evolution of the events which can be very beautifully defined through stereo studies. So that the initial spiking, the uh, development of the low voltage fast discharge subsequently and, and then the seizure spread and, and how that links to the semiology of the uh, seizures can be so well defined through these exquisite studies. And there the patient with the hand flapping and I, I think another point that uh, uh, Eileen and uh, Patrick Cheval were making in this were that some of the more proximal parts of frontal lobe were more responsible for the rocking movements and some of the more distal frontal regions for the peripheral hand movements and so on. Uh, again, you know, how, how, how stable these relationships are between and, and within patients is still a uh, work in progress. So what other techniques are there for analysing seizure semiology? Well, of course, we have a lot of video and, and very sophisticated and elaborate techniques of analysing video data are now available. In a ward setting, it's possible to do this where you can collect uh, video streams and do very sophisticated analysis of this, which will get us around a lot of the disputes ultimately, I guess, about what clinical features are first manifest and their relationship to the other, particularly motor changes that we observe in seizures. But fairly early days and of course, capturing good video from patients in, in inpatient monitoring is challenging and even more so in the ambulatory setting and as so much ambulatory monitoring is being done now and being shown to be so useful, uh, it will be a little more difficult to incorporate this sort of analysis, but no doubt that will occur. So finally though, I just want to talk about perhaps a, a different perspective and, and this work that I saw presented recently by uh, Alim Masvati looking at how we could examine this semiology from a probabilistic point of view and I guess uh, you know this is best known as the semio to brain project and really looks at all of the literature that was available um, analyzing the semiological manifestations that are described and their relationship to hard data around anatomy and an EEG localization. And so they were able to acquire an enormous range of figures and the chief objective was to remove the bias that we exhibit normally because of the common localization of, of many of the pathologies that we deal with, but also our tendency to try and relate everything uh, to phenomena that are already well described. So they tried to re remove this bias by correcting for the, um, correcting for the, the publication issues and, and uh, the topological bias. So, so here, uh, this is a slightly confusing graph, but here we have the uh, localization of events essentially uh, based on the original bias data and, and here when the bias has been mitigated and it does substantially alter our understanding of, uh, of seizures based on available literature. And they demonstrated this nicely in a series of, of plots here showing that uh, um, for instance epigastric uh, auras in isolation were a very powerful localizer. So the, in these graphs for the various symptoms, the epigastric and autonomic, for instance, the uh, bias data is presented in the, in the unshaded uh, circles and the blue circles relate when that's been corrected for bias. So epigastric isolation uh, phenomena are, are very closely related to temporal lobe origin. Autonomic features, uh, often to temporal, but often to frontal and, and sometimes to hypothalamic. Olfactory, strangely, 40% uh, were temporal, but 28% were parental, uh, parietal and 21% were uh, of frontal origin. Somatosensory auras, again, almost equal proportions of frontal, temporal and parietal origin. Uh, tonic and, and dystonic seizures are very strong frontal and oral and manual automatisms very strong for uh, temporal and frontal origins. But other autonomic features uh, more often came from hypothalamus, sometimes from the temporal lobe and, and sometimes from the frontal lobe. So it, it's an interesting approach to it and perhaps a way of removing some of our preconceived notions about what semiology means. So the impact of, of Jackson's work on, on clinical care and practice, well, it, it's, it's something, as I said, that we all do every day, so it's been very far reaching and 
understanding the semiology remains as important in clinical management as in his time, but particularly so with regard to surgery. And we can see how imaging and more recently the invasive EEG studies are allowing much more sophisticated interpretation of the patterns of uh, clinical seizure activity. But that newer techniques uh, may offer opportunities to improve our understanding of these various relationships between lesion location, connectivity, and the semiology of events. And uh, just thank you to, to those of my colleagues who very generously provided slides and, and thoughts and, uh, and their previous work on this. Uh, and thank you once again for the invitation. All right, everyone. Well, Mark, thank you so much for, for your talk. <clears throat> there was a scheduled uh, question and answer session, and I think we would have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, we do need to end at 11.45 sharp. I think we've got about five minutes. So there's anyone who would, I think, rather than have all the speakers come to the front just for time interest, why don't we get the questions? And if there's someone you have a particular question for, maybe you can come forward just to save time to uh, to get the questions going in the next, we got about five minutes. So any questions are welcomed and it's good people are enthusiastic about the rest of the meeting so they can get out and get in. Is the microphone on? A question for Dr. O'Brien. Oh. Is he he'll be, your, he'll be our only person who can't take a question, unfortunately, because okay. this isn't, this isn't uh, live stream, so. I have a question for Dr. Blumenfeld specifically. That's great, Hal. Please come on up. Yeah, please go ahead while Dr. Blumenfeld's coming up for the. Um, yeah. So, my question is uh, related to the micro lesioning effect that you sometimes see with DBS and Parkinson's. In your experience, is there a similar effect in epilepsy DBS, and does it have any role in? predictive markers intra or post-operatively? Um, thank you for the question. Um, let's see where you are, but uh, uh, there you are. Oh, good, terrific. Yes, thank you. Uh, there is uh, something called the implantation effect that's been observed in all clinical trials um, with, a with a neuropace RNS and the tronic uh, anterior thalamic DBS, um, where there is some uh, improvement in uh, seizures that last for three to four months after the implantation, presumably, um, you know, a microlesional effect. Uh, what we're doing right now is, is um, you know, again, a small early feasibility study with, with uh, a, a small group of patients, but we took that into account when we planned the, um, the timeline so that our randomized um, double-blind phase with the thalamic stimulation takes place uh, after four, you know, at least four months after the implantation to avoid that possible compound. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Hal. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, everyone, thank you so much for your attendance, and please enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you for the fantastic speakers. So.